I'll let everyone know on Discord that we have gone live, and then I will close down Discord. So are you enjoying your new home? Oh, yeah, we're definitely enjoying our new home. Um, I know that, you know, I know that the news and everything about, you know, what's going on in America and American, America falling apart, yada, 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 is always really bad. But I don't think that people realize just how much better it is in America, even in this state. Like, there's a reason, there's a reason why people are fleeing all across the United States to get here. It is just... Uh, you know, there's, you know, hyperinflation and yada, 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 but it's still just, it's just so nice to be here. And um, so uh, there's just things that you just don't account for and that you don't even remember until you get back here and you just realize, geez, um, people don't need to work that hard in the United States if they, if they choose to, to, to make mm -hmm. enough, to make enough money to, to, to survive. Um, and like in Canada, that just wasn't the case. I mean, people don't understand just how much money the government takes from you in, in places like Canada. I mean, it's just, you work so hard and they'll, they'll take half of what you make. Um, and then you'll go to buy something and there's 15% sales tax. And so, um, it's pretty much the same in Australia. I've done a few calculations and, and in the end of the day, you're paying around 60 to 70 percent tax. It's ridiculous. And people just out of the United States just don't know how much that just kills you. That kills your ambition. It, it, it's just so hard to just get even. So mm. it's really easy here. I, I mean, it just really is. I mean, um, in, in two years, we're already talking like if people really wanted to, they could retire you know, in their forties, uh, you know, if they didn't want to live like millionaires, but, uh, yeah, but yeah, we could, we could be living Zion's law really easily in the United States. We just, w you know, would this money, you know, not be better spent? You know, that's, uh, that's just where we are. Yeah. Wow. Everyone came in and dabbed me first, or as I say, dap, which is not correct, but what does that mean? That's that little that's just that little emoji with the uh, the guy with his hands off to the side. It's, oh, I see. It's it's this it's just it's this little you know gesture that means like victory or like success, and okay. so it's and it's no longer cool, which is why I use it. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's it's kind of like one of those things where I can use it and people can okay boomer me, and so uh, yeah, so I so that's why I I'm, like it. I'm so glad you explained what that meant because I thought every time I saw that everyone was dancing like they were just like happy like it was a dance move. <laughs> so that's how off I am. <laughs> yeah, so it's just your left arm is kind of up in the air like, you know, your like your babe Ruth thing pointing off into the stands and then your other arm you you look into your your elbow and that's the that's the dab or the the dap as I call it because I'm uh I can't say anything right. But um I can't do I, I if as simple a word as dab, I will screw it up for years and then can't correct myself. So, uh, yeah, I've never been, you know, people always compliment me and say, man, I wish I had your brain, Mike. I wish I could remember scriptures and, and do this the way that, you know, you can do. And I say, I wish I could just, rem you know, remember words sometimes. Like I, like I, <laughs> the way I speak is so funny, but, um, and I can't correct myself either. Like I can be sitting there and Ashley can, for, for example, uh, uh, car in a. And Ashley, when she came on to the fireside, Ashley and I practiced for a half an hour about, uh, you know, how to say her name properly. We get right into the fireside and I'm like, oh, yeah, Karina or, or something wrong. And uh, it was like, oh, my gosh, I practiced that for a half an hour. So, yeah, I, language is never one of my st my strong suits. So um, 
I'm glad that there are people that somewhere out there that can understand at least something I'm saying. So, well, thank you, everyone, everyone for joining. We got 33 people in here, so we're going to start. This one is a really, really uh, important one. It's a lectures on faith. Really important because we need to get these down. Uh, this is so uh, important for our time period is to develop this faith and so that we can do what's required of us in this generation. And, and we can't do it unless we know what it is. And so let's figure it out and then let's do it. And so we're going to be going over uh, lecture six today, but it's only going to be part one. And so I should probably change that in the title. But it's only part one. So I cut it in half because I thought that each one of these points was important enough that we should take the time to really make sure we know what's being said here and, and really get the most out of it. So I split it into two. This one uh, is a little bit different. It doesn't have questions, which we'll get into when we start the fireside. Um, but we're going to uh, introduce the two guests after we say a prayer. So we're going to start with a prayer. Uh, we'll, we'll introduce the two guests, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this lecture. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be gathered as saints in Zion, and we're grateful as we come to learn more of Thee, and we're especially touched that we have this opportunity on a Sabbath day that we can meet with those and edify one another. And we ask thee that thou wilt help us, that we can not only learn what we're to learn, but have the courage to go forward and act on the things that we're inspired to do. And again, we're grateful, Father, for this medium to be able to meet together in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right, so I will let Joseph introduce himself, and then we'll let Kelly introduce uh, Ryan and Kelly. Okay, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Joseph from Perth, Australia, uh, probably about an hour and a half, hour's drive from the two brothers. Um, and uh, I came across, well, the Lord led me to Micah and Blake and then the whole group of you guys probably in February of this year, and it's just been a wonderful journey of um, revelation, confirmation, and coming home. Um, for me, um, as we've seen in Discord, the redemption of Zion is just where we're at, and uh, Zion is people of one heart and one mind, and uh, I've struggled over the years to get people on one mind with me when as I teach and share this doctrine that I've and try to share study with other people. Um, but I find in this group, you know, 90% of what I believe, everyone else believes as well. And the other 10%, I'm being enlightened and I love it. And I love learning more and, and getting closer to God. And maybe that's a 70 30, I don't know. But it's been, it's just a good journey. So I'm super excited to be part of Lectures on Faith. I love Lectures on Faith. Uh, and I just realized, I know, that until we uh, rend the veil of unbelief and can attain the faith that is necessary for exaltation, we won't get there. So we've got to keep learning about faith. Um, and my lovely wife, Candice, you might, we, do, we have a YouTube channel. My wife, Candice, is on there. She's, I've been very blessed that she and I together are on this journey uh, to Zion. That's me. Okay, I will go ahead and go next. So this is Kelly and uh, my husband, Ryan, and I. Uh, we really enjoy um, just writing papers and interacting with people. And it's been quite a while um, since we've been involved in a fireside. So we're just... Um, excited. We live uh, in the Midwest in the United States. We have four kids and um, yeah, we just love the gospel. We enjoy studying and learning more. And uh, this lecture brought a lot of things um, with clarity 
to us. So yeah, we're excited to be here. All right. So as always, the the paper, what we're going to be going over today can be found for free. Um, so all the references that we have there, sometimes we, 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 we kind of go over them a little quick. Sometimes we don't actually read the references, but we always provide them in the paper. And so you can get the paper on Discord or you can get the paper on my family website or blog, whatever you want to call it. It's found in the link in the description below. You'll also find a link to um, uh, Joseph's YouTube channel in the link as well. And so hopefully all that works. We're going to be going over lecture six today and part one. And uh, as normal, um, with the, the way these lectures go, um, there's a lecture and then there's a bunch of questions and then they actually answer the questions. Um, and so we've been going through it with the question first, then we read from the lecture what it actually says, uh, and then we go into the answer. And so it's it, that's how we've been breaking it down. Um, this one, at the beginning of this lecture, it says, uh, quote, this lecture is so plain and the facts set forth so self-evident that it is deemed unnecessary to form a catechism upon it. The student is therefore instructed to commit the whole to memory, end quote. And so that, that's just awesome. But that's, uh, and so the expectation is this, is this is apparently so self-evident and so straightforward that I'm going to provide a questioning and answering. They just want you to memorize this. This is just something that we need to know um, as far as faith is concerned. And so what we've done is there's actually, I think, 12 um, paragraphs in here. And so what I've done is I've broken the first six paragraphs off, and that's going what we're going to be going over in part one. And then part two, we'll go over the, the, the next. So what we're going to do is we're going to take each of these paragraphs and separate them and read them one at a time. And so we're going to read the, the um, paragraph, and then we're going to hand it over to Joseph, where Joseph is going to tell us uh, you know, his thoughts and additions. And um, then we're going to hand it over to uh, Kelly and Ryan, uh, read by Kelly. And, uh, and then we'll go to me. So, and what I'm, um, doing is, uh, putting on our screen here, the actual quote. And so it should be popping up. Um, we debated putting a pumpkin on this just to set, just to get people to set their hairs on hair on fire, but we decided ultimately against it. But, um, I kind of liked, I kind of liked the pumpkin. I thought it was cute, but so, um, or it should be pop. There it is. Okay, so it's just popped up on the screen. So here's the actual uh, first paragraph, and so I will read it. And it says, quote, Having treated in the preceding lectures of the ideas of the character perfection, perfections and attributes of God, we next proceed to treat of the knowledge which persons must have that the course of life which they pursue is according to the will of God in order that they may be enabled to exercise faith in him unto life and salvation, end quote. Okay, so um, as I, I read through the whole uh, lecture and uh, I tried not to go into the second half of the lecture because it's all tied together, um, but then as I, I went through each paragraph, there is actually so much you could pull out of even this first paragraph, lots of different areas. So I decided to focus on faith and knowledge. Um, it's the, the knowledge that we have that our course of life is according to the will of God is, is very important. So I wanted to discuss knowledge. In my mind, uh, faith and knowledge are cyclic. And uh, unless you have faith and knowledge together, um, you're not going to progress and you're not going to go. So knowledge without faith is dead and faith without knowledge is dead and um, goes through. So let's just hit on a couple of quotes. From Joseph Smith, Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 148. Faith comes by hearing the word of God through the testimony of the servants of God. That testimony is always attended by the spirit of prophecy and revelation. And that flows uh, beautifully into the next two quotes. Page 217. A man is saved no faster than he gets knowledge. Hence, he, it needs revelation to assist us and give us knowledge of the things of God. So my thought process there is um, faith comes by hearing the word of God, scripture, prophets, um, as we understand those, uh, and we need revelation to, to uh, increase our faith. And uh, Joseph Smith also says that we, we need to get knowledge, and uh, knowledge comes by revelation. 
So if we want to increase in knowledge, we need to listen to the word of God and receive the revelation. And um, uh, just on that, it, it's interesting how we we uh, get sidetracked. And um, Micah shared a thing last uh, yesterday on Discord about, oh, I, I understand this scripture better now. And I had a similar experience. Um, and 124, Doctrine and Covenants, we just studied last week, where we read this and it's basically paraphrasing. I haven't got the quote here, but paraphrasing, uh, the Lord said, okay, you don't have to build Jackson County, Missouri at the moment, the temple there. Because of wicked men, you, you're off the hook. You don't have to do that anymore. And I've always thought, yeah, that's the mobs. That's the mobs. But what was revealed to me yesterday as I've been striving to plead with the Lord to reveal new things to me and help me to understand the scriptures as they really are, he just says wicked men. He doesn't say who they are. He just says they're wicked. And wicked men are those who do not obey God. And when you look at the history of the church, the, the reason why the mobs got so excited and really got hassled is because of the apostates that left the church and stirred them up. And so now I'm understanding, well, those wicked men to the third and fourth generation were actually members of the church who went apostate and caused all sorts of problems. Yet in the past, I always thought it was one other thing. And so I'm learning to more and more not rely upon the... the uh, the history that has been taught me. And then that's revelation that enlightens our minds and helps us to uh, become of one mind. So then with this idea of having this knowledge uh, or how to gain knowledge, um, I had to go back to lectures on faith. The first lecture, as we receive by faith all temporal blessings that we do receive, so in like manner, uh, received by faith all spiritual blessings that we do receive. But faith is not only the principle of action, but also power in all intelligent beings, whether in heaven or on earth. And I pause there for a second. I recommend you go back to the fireside where uh, Blake and uh, Michael went over faith, action and power. The explanation there was just powerful. I don't have time to go into, but um, anyway, continue on with the quote. Who cannot see that if God framed the worlds by faith and that it is by faith that he exercises power over them and that faith is a principle of power and that if a principle of power, it must, so, it must be so in men as well as in deity. And so then also in lecture two, let us here observe that after any portion of the human family is made acquainted with the important fact that there is a God who has created and does uphold all things, the extent of their knowledge respecting his character and glory will depend upon their diligence and faithfulness in seeking after him. Until, like Enoch, the brother of Jared, and Moses, they shall obtain faith in God and power with him to behold him face to face. So tying that together, um, the knowledge that we need to gain is that our course of life is in accordance to God's will. Um, how do we gain knowledge? We listen to the word of God. We read the scripture. Uh, we receive revelation, which increases our knowledge. And as Joseph taught in that last quote, when we come aware, become aware of this, we need to continue in faith, which means actually doing things. The knowledge is no good unless we actually put it into action. So we're going to be told what to do, how to do it. We've got to follow the Lord and what he's asking us to do, which will then increase our faith, which then will enable us to receive more knowledge and it will cyclic go round and round and round. Uh, and then that will lead into, into the other ones. So that's my first in input. Okay, thanks so much for for those thoughts. I really like the way that um, you tied the faith and knowledge um, together. So for us, uh, when we were looking at this section and this paper, it was, um, it's, it felt like every time we tried to write our words were so inadequate. Um, there's just such a depth to this paragraph. Like it's 
you know, you just, you can feel the power even in just like those four sentences. So to start this, you know, we're like, okay, let's, you know, break it into different sections. So we always try to um, teach our children first, and then we kind of see how it goes. Um, and, and we did that with this lecture on faith as well. And as we were um, teaching the kids, we're like, oh, you know, there's these same concepts again and again, um, and like throughout this paper. So we really um, wanted to kind of draw people in when it talks about um, the, you know, the first concept is knowledge. And after that, it's we have to have that knowledge. And like, that's the very, very first thing. So as you're listening to parts of this, you're going to want to remember like that very, very first piece is the knowledge. Um, the part right after that is about the course of life that we pursue. So if you're looking at the Bible dictionary, um, course is often used a lot of the times to mean direction, leading a path or a way. Um, so it's, you know, every time we have a path that the prophets talk about, or we talk about the straight and the narrow way, um, we want our life to match the examples that we have in the scriptures. The third concept is that comes off of that is knowledge that that course is according to the will of God. So I think the the distinction here is you can be doing everything right as like a member of the church, right? You're on the path, you're, you know, trying to do the directions and things. But there's a difference between paying your tithing, going to church, magnifying your calling, all of those things, and also knowing that as you're doing those things, you're following um, the will of God. So um, Ryan and I actually had an experience where we had an opportunity um, and we're like, okay, we're just going to pack up and move and it's going to, you know, we prayed about it and it was like, nope, no, you need to stay. And we were like, maybe we didn't phrase this the right way. We really want to do this and we think it's the right decision. Um, and then we got really strongly a second time. No, you need to stay in this area. So we were, um, you know, we were doing all of the things we were, you know, pursuing the course of life. Uh, but it was the first time that, you know, kind of early in our marriage, we felt that there's a there's a difference between following on the path and knowing that that path is according to the will of God. Um you know, I I remember very distinctly when we were told, no, you need to stay here. Um, you know, just kind of like throwing my hands in the, the air. And I was like, fine, fine, I'll stay. But, you know, like I wasn't wasn't happy about it. Right. And the very um, I think it was two Sundays later, we sang that song. Right. I'll go where you want me to go. And I don't know why I never pieced this together before then, but the very next thing was, I'll stay where you want me to stay. And I think for whatever reason, like we had always assumed that it was always moving. It was always doing something different. It was, you know, wherever we were going on that path, it was always a forward direction. And I think it can really be a challenge sometimes for us to be told, stay where you need to stay. Um, and and so I, I just 
call that example out to kind of show that that difference um, between the course of life and knowing that that course is according to the will of God. Um, so as we continue on uh, in the paper, so the the end result of you know the knowledge, the course of life, knowing that our course is according to the will of God, we actually have faith. We're enabled to exercise faith. And there's a difference between being enabled to exercise faith and having faith. Um, so the very, the very last um, piece of that then is because we're able to exercise that faith, we have life and salvation. We uh, found an article by Joseph Fielding Smith, um, and we did the math on this, so hopefully it's not wrong. <laughs> but in 1971, so almost 50 years ago, uh, he spoke about, you have to understand who God is. And he gave a warning 50 years ago that there are members of the church who do not have a true knowledge of our Heavenly Father. And if members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints have not already studied or listened or understood the lectures on faith to this point, because we're on lecture six, it's going to be really, really difficult to understand um, because each each lecture on faith is kind of like going up a step. So President uh, Joseph Fielding Smith said, in every age, the Lord's prophets have been called upon to combat false worship and proclaim truth. In ancient Israel, there were many who worshiped images and gods. And Isaiah asked, to whom then will ye liken God? Or what likeness will ye compare unto him? And I think one of the one of the really the great tragedies is if we have members of the church that don't worship God as he truly is, because they don't have that knowledge, it becomes instead um, a God of their own making. And um, I felt that, you know, there were some verses in Isaiah. So looking back to Isaiah's response that you have to know about the everlasting God. So going on with the quote, much of the world today does not have this knowledge of God. And even in latter day Israel, there are those who have not perfected their understanding of that glorious being. And I would ask those that are kind of listening to us reading this paper, like, do you feel that your knowledge is perfect? And if it is or if it isn't, you know, you have opportunities there to figure out what does perfect understanding mean to you. And I think the lectures on faith are a really great spot to start. Um, and so he continues, to those without this knowledge, we might well say, why dost thou limit the glory of God? Or why should ye suppose that the that he is less than he is? Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth is infinite and eternal, that he has all power, all might, and all dominion, and he knows all things, and that all things are present before his face. So when I think about, um, you know, the, the miraculous events that we know will shortly come to place, um, there are times that we need to say to others, I know in whom I trust. I know that he has power 
to bring back the lost tribes of Israel. I know that he has power to build up a new Jerusalem. And it, it's almost like you're wanting to, you know, say, hast thou not known, hast thou not heard him? Um, and I just feel really strongly that we're doing, sorry, um, we have to know our Heavenly Father and know him with that perfect understanding because that's how we will see these miracles in our life. And that's how we're able to stand and say, I am not ashamed of the Lord and I will wait for him. And I'm done with that part. All right. Thank you both. Um, so it wouldn't be a, a fireside with Micah talking if I didn't start off with a giant uh, scripture chain. And so here we go. So uh, this is what I'm going to be using, which I always try to do, a scripture chain that we're going to build upon as we go through what we're learning here. So we're going to start in Doctrine and Covenants 121, and we're going to start in verse 44, that he may know that thy faithfulness is stronger than the cords of death, let thy bowels also be full of charity towards all men and to the household of faith and let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly. Then shall thy confidence wax strong in the presence of God and the doctrine of the priesthood shall distill upon thy soul as the dews from heaven, end quote. Okay, so we need to have this knowledge that our life is on the path that God wants us on, or we will not have the confidence to go to God and exercise faith in him sufficient for life and salvation, let alone wax strong enough to be brought into his presence, as was the case with the brother of, of Jared and his faith. So what builds that foundation, the foundation, the core, so that we can wax stronger and stronger in confidence? And what is the biggest obstacle to that? Okay, let's go to Proverbs 14. Verses 26 and 27, in the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is a foundation of life to depart from the snares of death. Uh, uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 14, and many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 25 and 26, Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. For the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. Doctrine and Covenants chapter 3, uh, verses 6 uh, through eight. And behold, how oft you have transgressed the commandments and laws of God and have gone on in the persuasions of men. For behold, you have not, uh, for behold, you should not have feared man more than God. Although men set at naught the counsels of God and despise his words, yet you should have been faithful, and he would have extended his arm and supported you against all the fiery darts of the adversary. And he would have been with you in every time of trouble. Uh, Doctrine and Covenants chapter uh, 45, verses 28 and 29. And when the times of the Gentiles is come in, a light shall break forth among them that sit in darkness, and it shall be the fullness of my gospel. But they receive it not, for they perceive not the light, and they turn their hearts from me because of the precepts of men. Second Nephi chapter 28. Yea, Woe be unto him that hearkeneth unto the precepts of men and denieth the power of God and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Cursed is he that putteth his trust in man or maketh flesh his arm or shall hearken unto the precepts of men. Second Nephi chapter 27 verse 25. For as much as his people draw near unto me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their hearts far from me and their fear towards me is taught by the precepts of men, end quote. So what have we learned or what should we have learned from these scriptures? We've learned that walking that path 
that we know the Lord wants us on is to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Um, Philippians 2, chapter uh, chapter 2, verse 12, uh, Psalms chapter 2, verse 11, Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verse 5, etc., all uh, good places or good um, scriptures that you can turn to, to to further prove that. And the counter to that, the counter to the truth is, is that is to fear the Lord according to man's precepts, or as was uh, told to Joseph Smith Jr. above, quote, to fear man more than God, end quote. What does this fearing the Lord according to man's precepts, what does that look like? Well, Nephi tells us in 2 Nephi chapter 28, when he says, quote, and there shall be many which shall say, eat, drink, and be merry. Nevertheless, fear God. He will justify in committing a little sin. Yea, lie a little, take advantage of one because of his words. Dig a pit for thy neighbor. There is no harm in this. And do all these things for tomorrow we die. And if it so be we're guilty, God, God will beat us with a few stripes. And at last, we shall be saved in the kingdom of God, end quote. And finally, what causes us to fear man more than God and adapt this false attitude? Doctrine and Covenants chapter 121, behold, there are many called, but few are chosen. And why are they not chosen? Because their hearts are set so much upon the things of this world and aspire to the honors of men, end quote. Simply put, they love the world more. And we will get uh, more information on this when we get to point five in this lecture. So, point two. Or uh, paragraph two. Should be coming up on our screen right now. Okay, it says, quote, This knowledge su uh, supplies an important place in revealed religion, for it was by reason of it that the ancients were enabled to endure as seeing him who is invisible, an actual knowledge to any person that the course of life which he pursues is in according to the in a, is according to the will of God is essentially necessary to enable him to have that confidence in God, without which no person can obtain eternal life. It was this that enabled the ancient saints to endure all their afflictions and persecutions and to take joyfully the spoiling of their goods, knowing not believing merely that they had a more enduring substance, end quote. Okay, so what I wanted to hone in on this uh, particular paragraph was the point where it says, uh, we're enabled to endure as seeing him who is invisible. Um, and my thoughts turn to how do we see him who is invisible? And uh, we need to get to the point where we have our calling and election made sure and then have the second comforter. And once we've been at that point, uh, we then definitely will have confidence. Um, and so that's what we should be working towards. So again, I'll read from Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith. Then I would exhort you to go on and continue to call upon God until you make your calling and election sure for yourselves by obtaining this more sure word of prophecy and wait patiently for the promise until ye obtain it, etc. Um, as I talk about this, I want to just, um, the last fireside that they talked about belief. Do we really believe the scriptures? Do we really believe what Joseph Smith tells us? Um, and so do we really believe that we can make our calling and election sure in this life? Certainly Joseph Smith is telling us to, Peter tells us to. And so that belief is a very important part of gaining knowledge and faith. Joseph Smith continues in page 306, we have no claim in our eternal compact in relation to eternal things unless our actions and contracts and all things tend to this. But after all this, you have got to make your calling and election sure. If this injunction would lie largely on those to whom it was spoken, how much more those of the present generation? The first key is knowledge. Sorry, first key, knowledge is power of salvation. Second key, making your calling and election sure. And third key, it is one thing to be on the mount and hear the excellent voice, etc. And another thing to hear the voice declare to you, you have part 
and Lot in that kingdom. So it's an, it would be lovely to see a vision of the Saviour or to hear his voice, but more importantly, what we want to hear him say to us is that we have part in the exaltation. We have part in that kingdom. So continue on in what we're doing. And that will certainly give us uh, uh, the, the ability, the confidence to keep moving forward. John chapter 14, verses 15 to 18. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that excuse me, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot perceive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So this is just before the Saviour uh, was crucified. And so he's, he's telling the apostles that he will come and visit with us. And so teachers of the prophet Joseph Smith, page 150 to 51, the comforter spoken of is a subject of great interest and perhaps understood by few of this generation. After a person has faith in Christ, <clears throat> repents of his sins and is baptised for the remission of his sins and receives the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands, which is the first comforter, then let him continue to humble himself before God hungering and thirsting after righteousness and living by every word of God. And the Lord will soon say unto him, Son, thou shalt be exalted. When the Lord has thoroughly proved him and finds that the man is determined to serve him at all hazards, then the man will find his calling and election made sure. Then it will be his privilege to receive the other comforter, which the Lord hath promised the saints, as is recorded in the testimony of St. John, which I read, just read earlier on. So just pause on that comment for a second. This is mind-blowing to me. Um, do I believe the scriptures? Do they say what they mean? Do they mean what they say? <clears throat> do I take them at their word? The Saviour is telling us that we can receive our calling election made sure and that the comforter. Now, if we don't believe that, it's not going to happen. We've got to believe it, not just talk about it. Um, and if we want to redeem Zion and be uh, part of that redemption process, we need to be at a point where we actually receive, can receive our calling election, make sure the group that go to Zion, the Saviour is going to be in the midst with them. Um, the, these will be the pure and those that serve him in righteousness. So let's just continue on a bit more. Now, what is this other comforter? Is it no more? It is no more nor less than the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, and this is the sum and substance of the whole matter: that when any man obtains this last comforter, he will have the personage of Jesus Christ to attend him, or appear to him from time to time, and even. He will manifest the Father unto him, and they will take up their abode with him, and the visions of heavens of the heavens will be opened unto him, and the Lord will teach him face to face, and he may have a perfect knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And this is the state and place of the ancient saint that the ancient saints arrived at when they had such glorious visions, Isaiah, Ezekiel, John on, upon the Isle of Patmos, and St. Paul in the three heavens, and all the saints who held communion with the General Assembly and Church of the Firstborn. Um, I, I just hope that uh, we can all plant in our minds that it is possible. We're talking only years and getting closer and closer for the redemption of Zion to actually happen. And we want to be a part of that. And so we need to believe that this is possible, that the redemption of Zion will happen, that Joseph Smith will come out openly, that he will select those who are worthy to have their calling election made sure or have had their calling election made sure, and then can move forward and do the work that needs to be done. Um, I, 
the Lord is just opening to my mind that this is actually real. This is happening. My wife and I were discussing it this morning. That's blowing us away that this is real. This can and will happen. Um, and what Micah's quotes through the scriptures, that's the path to doing it. And we need to have faith and believe that it will happen. Um, and so all of this will enable us to handle whatever come. Come what may, we can handle it. Because, one, we believe that our calling election will be made sure, or, two, it will have been made sure. And that can can really happen because of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and because of his grace. Uh, that was my thoughts on that, so that paragraph. Okay, back to me. Um, for for this section, um, hi. Uh, again, we we really struggled to try to put into words like the thoughts um, and emotions that we had as well. So Elder Neil A. Maxwell gave um, a really good talk called The Christ-Centered Life. And in it, um, he talks about our personal progress and drawing closer to the Savior. Um, so that requires the trusting in the Lord's plan, not only for mankind, but also for each of us. Um, so by drawing closer to the Lord, that means that he is in charge um, of our lives. And so it, it really takes a lot of humility and a lot of dedication and devotion to be able um, to have the Lord in charge of your life. And so Elder Maxwell says, we must resist the caresses of the world, knowing that insofar we're already resisting um, getting away from Babylon. And it says, moreover, we need to do this during a time of tremendous temptation. And he talks about how the adversary blurs the lines between things that are holy and things that are profane. And he continues, for those of us who stay on that course. So if you remember from the first part, we talked about you're going to hear the word course again and again. It's one of those concepts. So knowing that the course that we're on, we will be able to meet our ancestors and disciples in the past, that they will praise us for our achievements and our courage, just as we have often praised them for meeting their individual challenges. And I, I can't think of a better experience to have than with our ancestors, with turning our hearts um, back towards them and to meet them face to face and know that we have met this challenge, that we've really put the Lord in charge of our life. And the next part says, the Lord is preparing a very peculiar people. And this phrase really stood out to me. Um, we had a Halloween kind of like party thing, I guess, at church on Wednesday. Um, it wasn't on a Sunday. I want to be clear. <laughs> so if people don't write me emails to Micah. It was not during conference or a Sunday. Um, but there was, you know, like uh, this Halloween thing. And so in our in our ward, we have seven missionaries. And um, the missionaries would have you stand in a line and you could only get a piece of candy from like the questions that she answered. Right. And um, so knowing my kids are extremely competitive. And so, of course, 
my son like never left. He just kept standing there answering questions and getting candy and other people got really frustrated with him. Um, you know, and, and so someone said, well, how does he know all of this? Like, how does he know all this stuff that, you know, nobody else seems to know? And I was kind of a little taken back. Um, but this, this thought came about being a peculiar people or a particular, I guess, uh, see, Mike is rubbing off on me. It's not peculiar, it's particular. So we're going to have to edit that. Okay. <laughs> the Lord has a very particular people. Um, you know, I don't want to raise a son that knows more about sports or can answer those kinds of questions than they can about a gospel. I really feel strongly as a mother, my calling is to raise my children because they are particular people who were saved for very particular chores. And I think that's part of giving people something to really long for. We have to have something in our life that we don't want to put the scriptures down because we want to be ready for whatever chore that we're asked to do. And I think, you know, as this goes on, Elder Maxwell says, our schooling here cannot be a casual thing or we cannot have joy there. And we'll talk more about kind of how this how this leads into where we where we end up for eternity. But we can't be casual. We can't just be, oh, well. Like, I think, I think they'll, they'll learn it. Like, we have to know that we are on the right path. We have to know that the way we're right, raising our children is the right path. And as we gain that knowledge, that's when we really see the blessings, the miracles, that's when we have these desires to bring about the redemption of Zion. So I would rather a thousand times have a geeky 11-year-old kid that knows the Bible and the Book of Mormon and can be described as being a little peculiar because I don't want this world anymore. And Elder Maxwell says, as we make our way righteously and resolutely, the gatekeeper is Jesus Christ, and he employeth no servant there. If we come to know him now, and I would say, and truly know him and have that perfect understanding of who he is, then he will know us there. And that's the end of mine. All right. Thank you both. Um, okay. So we have, um, building upon what I went over in the last section, those sets of scriptures, Let's add some more scriptures to them and let's build upon our knowledge. So let's go to 1 John chapter 3 and it reads, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. 
for we shall see him as he is. Moroni chapter 7, verse 48. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, pray unto the Father with all the energy of heart that ye may be filled with this love, which he has bestowed upon all who are true followers of his Son, Jesus Christ, that ye may become the sons of God, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, that we may have this hope, that we may be purified even as he is pure. Amen. First John chapter 4, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. End quote. Love isn't simply an emotion. Charity isn't simply a feeling. In previous lectures, we learned that the Holy Ghost is the mind and will of God. It is the knowledge we gain as we act in the way the Lord would act, and by so doing, our confidence waxes stronger and stronger. Joseph Smith, in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, page 9, we read, quote, Until we have perfect love, we are liable to fall. And when we have a testimony that our names are sealed in the Lamb's Book of Life, we have perfect love. And then it is impossible for false Christs to deceive us, end quote. To have a testimony that our names are sealed in the Lamb's Book of Life is to have one's calling and election made sure, which Joseph went over above. So now we have built upon the concepts of fearing the Lord and working out our salvation with fear and trembling, which develops in us the mind of God and love, which will eventually culminate with having one's calling and election made sure, which will grant unto one perfect love. Okay, number three. Should be coming up on our screen shortly. Quote, having the assurance that they were pursuing a course which was agreeable to the will of God, they were enabled to take not only the spoiling of their goods and the wasting of their substance joyfully, but also to suffer death in its most horrid forms, knowing, not merely believing, that when this earthly house of their tabernacle was dissolved, they had a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, end quote. Okay, so out of this paragraph, I focused in on um, the assurance. Now, in the last, well, first of all, what I did want to say is, uh, Ellie and, and Michael, I just love how this is all coming together and that it's that the different views are bringing in such a powerful um, uh, song together that's harmonious. And so I just want to concentrate on assurance. Now, having highlighted the fact that um, to to be able to suffer death in the most horrid forms, et cetera, et cetera, you really want to be having your calling and election made sure and have had the second comforter with you and then uh, come what may, you you can deal with it. But what about before that happens? And uh, so Micah covered very well in, in the first section, the scripture chain, where we're having the confidence before God and follow him and being obedient. And so working towards that, but also um, or adding to that is do you believe it? Do you believe that this can happen? This is really important. If you Over the years, as I've discussed, um, calling election made sure and the second coming with people, they just go, oh, yeah, but that won't happen to me. Oh, you know, how, how can I do this? Um, and even, you know, I've had the thoughts, how can I ever be worthy to be in the presence of the Saviour and even the Father to visit me? Yes, a brother of Jared, yes, uh, Paul and all these great men, yes, they can do it, but, but surely not me. However, the Lord has... Um, told me over and over again, do you believe the scriptures? Do you believe what I'm telling you? I'm telling you in the scriptures over and over again, you you can be saved. You can obtain eternal life. You can 
attain these things. And so, therefore, you can have your calling election made sure. You can have the Saviour visit with you. This is available to you because of the grace of God. There are things that you will need to do. You will need to become. You will need to accept me. You will need to follow me and be willing to do um, what we wanted to do. Now, so this is a very important point for the redemption of Zion. Um, we all, to Zion is one heart and one mind, and it just gets up my goat when I have raised this in class. And oh yeah, I've met many. I've travelled the world in business, and I've met many lovely people who are of one heart. They're, they're pure in heart. Yeah, you're not getting it. You can't believe in in Muhammad or in hoo-ha or in whatever else, and then I believe in Jesus Christ, and we're of one heart and one mind. We're not. We believe different things. We have to believe the same thing. We can't even believe that uh, Jesus Christ is going to save someone who has broken their sin, broken their covenants in this life and then died and then we do some work for them or because or, they didn't finish their covenants or, or we think they're going to be saved. If they haven't done what they're supposed to do, they're not going to be saved. So what we need to do is to look at ourselves to get to the point where we can have our calling mixture made sure and make sure we are on the correct path, believing that it will happen. So there's a couple of quotes I want to read for that. The first thing we need to do is not follow Satan. And yeah, you can say, oh, that's obvious. Uh, however, any time we rebel, we are following Satan. That is the sin of Satan. He is rebellion. I turn to Messiah chapter 15, 26 to 27. But behold, and fear and tremble before God, for ye ought to tremble. For the Lord redeemeth none such that rebel against him and die in their sins. Yea, even all those that have perished in their sins ever since the world began and that willfully rebel against God, that have known the commandments of God and would not keep them, these are they that have no part in the first resurrection. Therefore, ought ye not to tremble. For salvation cometh to none such, for the Lord hath redeemed none such. Yea, neither can the Lord redeem such, for he cannot deny himself, for he cannot deny justice when it has its claim. Um, now, that, that's very painful. Uh, but do we believe God? Um, I think of some of my children who have turned away from their covenants. And if they don't uh, repent and die in their sin, they can't have part in the morning of the first resurrection. They can't have exaltation. But what they can have is if I do my best and I uh, attain to my calling election made sure and I attain to exaltation, I can bless them. I can be a blessing to their family. I can't bring them in to have the exaltation, but the more, but I can do stuff for them. I can help them. And so that's part of my motivation um, for uh, striving to attain exaltation. So we need to root out all rebellion. Um, what can I say more on that? Well, yeah, what I do need to say is we need to be really careful. Rebellion even is, I guess, point in case. Yeah, the prophet said to get the jab, but he didn't mean me, whatever the reasons are. Uh, how are we going to follow the Lord? However, we are all sinners. There is no doubt. Um, uh, let it be that my sins are weakness, not rebellion. And then, but then think about this and just be careful about this. Oh, yeah, but it's just a weakness. You know, I don't have to worry about that because it's a weakness. Let's read some scriptures. Second Nephi 25, uh, verse 23. For we labor diligently to write to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do, not, oh, they're just weaknesses, I don't have to worry about them. We have to work on those weaknesses. We have to have no rebellion, but we've got to be working on our weaknesses 
And then the Lord tells us a bit more about that in Jacob 4, 7. Nevertheless, the Lord God showeth us our weakness that we may know that it is by his grace that and his great condescension unto the children of men that we have power to do these things. Power to do what? We have power to have our calling election made sure. We do not have to be perfect to have our calling election made sure. We have to have removed all rebellion, um, come to a knowledge of God through study, prayer, fasting, doing stuff, doing whatever the Lord asks us to do. And then through the grace of God, while we are still sinners, we will have the power to have claim upon our calling and election made sure. And like the brother of Jared, we'll see the finger because we cannot be held without that. And then in Ether, um, these are one of the part, uh, Ether chapter 12, verse 27. And if men come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. I give unto men weakness that they may be humble. And my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, I will make weak things become strong unto them. It's so wonderful that Heavenly Father gives us these weaknesses and 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 that this earth life that we may be uh, have the experiences and learn. And if we are humble and come unto Christ, His grace is sufficient to take us and turn us, so that our weaknesses will become our strengths, and we will become celestial beings. It's an effortful thing to become a celestial being. We can't just uh, sit in the back row and just glide along. You have to put in the effort. Um, and then I share with you a quote from Neil A. Maxwell, a talk he gave, Swallowed Up in the Will of the Father. The submission of one's will is really the only uniquely personal thing that we have to place on God's altar. The many other things we give are actually the things that he has already given or loaned to us. And so we need to submit our will to his. Um, I, I just There's a few scriptures. That, um, Second Nephi. Second Nephi chapter 31, uh, 2, and then 17 to 21, and then continuing on to 32, 1 to 3. So uh, they split these chapters up. But I really think these should all be together. And listen how it sounds when you read it all together. Um, Nephi is uh, speaking, I must speak concerning the doctrine of Christ. Wherefore, do the things which I have told you, I have seen that your Lord and your Redeemer should do. For for this cause have they been shown unto me, that ye might know the gate by which ye should enter. For the gate by which ye should enter is repentance and baptism by water. And then cometh the remission of your sins by fire and by the Holy Ghost. And then are ye in the straight and narrow path which leads to eternal life. Yea, ye have entered in by the gate. Ye have done according to the commandment of the Father and the Son, and ye have received the Holy Ghost, which witnesses of the Father and the Son, unto, unto the fulfilling of the promise which he hath made, that ye entered in by the way ye should receive. And now, my beloved brethren, after ye have gotten into this straight and narrow path, I would ask if all is done. Behold, I say unto you, Nay, for ye have not come thus far, save it were by the word of Christ, with unshaken faith in him, relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. Wherefore, ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and the love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the words of Christ, and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. Pause. Do I believe the scriptures? This, this is such a clear step by step what we need to do. And we will gain eternal life if we do this. Continuing. And now behold, my beloved brethren, this is the way, and there is none other way nor name given under heaven whereby man can be saved in the kingdom of God. And now behold, this is the doctrine of Christ and the only and true doctrine of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, which is one God without end. Amen. And now, my beloved 
Sorry, and now behold, my beloved brethren, I suppose that ye ponder somewhat in your hearts concerning that which ye should do after ye have entered in by the way. But behold, why do you ponder these things in your heart? Do you not remember that I said unto you that after ye have received the Holy Ghost, ye could speak with the tongue of angels? And now how could ye speak with the tongue of angels, save it were by the power of the Holy Ghost? Angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost, wherefore they speak the words of Christ. Wherefore I said unto you, feast upon the words of Christ. For behold, the words of Christ will tell you all things that ye should do. Um, just powerful. I actually, actually missed, the, missed the, the verse. The verse after that says, and you will continue to do these things until Christ comes to you. And then when he comes to you, you'll do whatever he says to, for you to do. I'll update that quote in the notes. Um, and so what I realised here is that Nephi takes us through from baptism through to calling and election made sure and the second comforter. Um, and that's the path. That, is, that can happen. It's written through all the scriptures the Lord is pleading for us to do. And we must do this. There must be a group of men and women who do this to redeem Zion. For when Joseph goes out to call those to come and redeem Zion, it will be these people. They will have either received their calling election made sure or they will receive it when Joseph calls them. Um, and so for us to be a one heart, one mind, do we believe this? Are we working towards this? Are we all doing this together? And the first part is belief. We've got to believe it's true. Know that it can happen to us. Have that assurance that it can happen to us. And then come what may, whatever challenges come, just keep hanging in there. Do it because we believe in this, and then we will get to the point. And, and the Heavenly Father will, I can't remember the scripture reference, but Heavenly Father will not give us a challenge that we cannot handle and that he will make a way for us to handle that. Um, and so the reason the challenges come and that we, we have all these difficulties to go through is to help us to become celestial beings so that we can get to the point where we receive our calling and election made sure we have the the Holy Ghost. And the reason we have those things is so that we can continue on in the service of God in reaching out to others uh, and helping them to come unto God. That were my thoughts from that paragraph. Okay, so I um, have some thoughts here as well. And I, I agree that I, I really enjoy the way everything kind of harmonizes and how even with unique viewpoints it kind of shows the the same path so we included um, and this is by president faust he uh, gave a talk in general conference called where do i make my stand and he says we need to try to be faithful every hour of every day. So I'm just going to like pause and, you know, let people kind of soak that in. But he was like every hour of every day so that our foundation of trust in the Lord will never be shaken. And that's what I want to have. That's what we want for our family, that we're able to be faithful every hour of every day because we're not going to be able to withstand what is coming without having that faith and that strong foundation. So he goes on that his message is one of hope and counsel for those who wonder about things that are unfair in this life. And similar to the other thoughts, he said, our love of God must be pure without selfish intent. The pure love of Christ must be the motive in our devotion. And thinking back to 
some of the things that Micah said, you know, remember that pure love of Christ, like that is the motive. That's why we want to get to where we're headed. And he, um, President Faust says, all of the suffering that we see in the world could be unfair if everything ended at death, but it doesn't. And he goes on to really ground us that life is not a one act play. We had a past act when we were in the premortal existence. We have our present act. And then we have the future when we return to live with God. So really staying focused on this is only one part. And what happens during this part determines everything going forward. So President Faust says it's not so much what happens to us but how we deal with what happens to us. And I think we're seeing so many examples of that where people are either trying to be faithful every hour of every day or like those in Alma's day, they're becoming hardened that they're cursing God. And it's the same circumstances. So President Faust says each of us has to have our own storehouse of faith. And it's because of that foundation. It's because of that strength that we have the belief of the second comforter the belief of the calling and election that we can make our stand. We can demonstrate our devotion to God with our daily acts of righteousness. And he says, he can know where we stand. So the Lord then knows. For all of us in this life is a time of sifting and refining. We all face trials. Back to you, Micah. All right. So um, before I begin, uh, I'll just add this scripture here. And this is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. This is what Joseph just, Joseph just referenced. And I think it fits in here really nicely. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. And um, I really enjoyed uh, the thoughts that were provided above, and I only wanted to add a couple sets of scriptures that I thought augmented what was said above. And the first one was in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, <clears throat> which says, quote, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am, am I made strong. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 uh, through 11, quote, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made comfortable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the just, end quote. 
All right, so we'll go to point four. Or paragraph four. This one's a little bit longer. Should be coming on the screen shortly. And it says, quote, Such was and always will be the situation of the saints of God that unless they have an actual knowledge that the course that they are pursuing is according to the will of God, they will grow weary in their minds and faint. For such has been and always will be the opposition in the hearts of unbelievers and those that know not God against the pure and unadulterated uh, unadulterated religion of heaven, the only thing which ensures eternal life, that they will uh, that they will persecute to the uttermost all that worship God according to His revelations, receive the truth in the love of it, and submit themselves to be guided and directed by His will, and drive them to such extremities that nothing short of an actual knowledge of their being the favorites of heaven, and of their having embraced that order of things which God has established for the redemption of man, will enable them to exercise that confidence in him necessary for them to overcome the world and obtain that crown of glory, which is laid up for them that fear God, end quote. Okay, so, um, so much in here. What I did want to just point out is um, with the plan of salvation, it's actually a very successful plan when you consider that celestial, terrestrial, and telestial beings are all saved. Those who are sons of perdition and who followed Satan are those who are not saved. And uh, Satan and his followers were one-third part of heaven, not one, not 33.3% of heaven. So we don't know exactly how a number followed him, but it was a one-third part of heaven that went with him. Um, so when you consider everyone's been saved that. What we're discussing tonight, though, is people who are striving to become in the celestial kingdom, but not only in the celestial kingdom, those who are striving to become in the top degree. There are three degrees in the celestial kingdom, and the t only those in the top degree are those who are exalted and become as God is. And so the lectures on faith are helping people to attain to that. And that's what we, we're about. And through each individual attaining to that, we can then help and assist others attain to that and also others attain to whichever, whichever salvation they choose to, to come to. Um, but to, to the best that they can have. And so that, that's, that's a, I think, part of that love that, that Joseph Smith was talking about. We want to help everyone. Um, we, we certainly don't want people going into uh, being sons of perdition, but we want to help them to be saved to the best they want to, and we want to be the best. So this, so this is really interesting. So as he goes through this, um, I love the way it says, against the pure and unadulterated religion of heaven. And to me, that is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, in brackets, um, those that have the power of the Lamb of God, uh, those who will become the Church of the Firstborn. So it's not every member of the Church of Jesus. It's not actually the, 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 the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is scaffolding. It's there to help prepare. It will have its job done at some particular point, and then we'll move on to a more celestial order, which eventually will be the patriarchal order. That is the order of heaven. Um, so what of those who desire to come into that order? Um, without knowledge, one will not handle the trials that will come. Um, so thinking about this too, we want to redeem Zion. We, we want a group of people, and I know my wife and I, We've discussed this over and over again. I want Joseph Smith to call me, and however he does that, <laughs> I want him to call me and say, Joseph, I want you to be with me. That is my uh, uh, my heart's desire. Uh, and I, I pray and ask the Lord, is that something that I can, uh, I can desire? And the answer was an unequivocal yes. 
So I know that if I am worthy, uh, so sorry, as long as I continue on the path that I am on, because I ask every day or I, I'm, I'm checking in with the Lord every day, as long as I continue on this path, this will happen. I believe it and then and I'm going to do everything I can to make that happen. But what I'm also not naive of is that by asking that, I need to be proved. Uh, Joseph Smith in page 32 of the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith said, you are not yet as yet brought into as trying circumstances. So the background of this is uh, the saints are being kicked out of Missouri. Uh, the extermination order was hit, blah, 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 blah. And so uh, Joseph Smith is writing to them and giving him some uh, help. Um, you have not yet brought into as trying circumstances as were the prophets and apostles. Call to mind Daniel and the three Hebrew children, Jeremiah, Paul, Stephen, and many others, too numerous to mention, who were stoned, sawn asunder, tempted, slain by the sword, and wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and hid in dens and caves of the earth, yet they will obtain a good report through faith, and amidst all their afflictions, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to receive persecution for Christ's sake. We know not what we shall be called to pass through before Zion is delivered. I just want to repeat that. I'm assuming that everyone here that's in this fire or that hears my voice um, is wanting to be part of the redemption of Zion and wants to go to Zion. So we know not what we shall be called to pass through before Zion is delivered and established. Therefore, we have great need to live near God and always be in strict obedience to all his commandments that we may have confidence void of offence toward God and man. Let us not be naive. Um, even if Joseph Smith comes out openly next conference or in the next few months or in the next year, what are we going to be called to go through? And, it, and, and if we, each of us, have been called by Joseph Smith to come and redeem Zion, what is that going to require of us? What is our sacrifice? Um, John Taylor shared an experience that he had with Joseph Smith. This is found in Deseret News um, semi-weekly, August 21, 1883. He said, I heard the prophet say in speaking to the 12 on one occasion, you will have, to, you will have all kinds of trials to pass through and it is quite as necessary for you to be tried as it was for Abraham and other men of God. And he and said he, God will feel after you and he will take hold of you. And wrench your very heartstrings. And if you cannot stand it, you will not be fit for the inheritance in the celestial kingdom of God. Um, brothers and sisters, if you're going to do a marathon, you need to practice, you need to exercise, you need to get yourself healthy. Um, a marathon is, is nothing compared to redeeming Zion. Are we willing to do whatever it takes? Are we going to um, listen to, to the call of God, what he wants us to do? If we do this, the reward is great um, if we do it. Uh, I don't think it was a coincidence. Someone posted up a, um, a talk by Truman Madsen, and he shared uh, just last night in, in Discord, and so I had a look at it. He shared there that his, I think it was great-great-grandfather, heard about the church, and he was in the eastern states, and he said um, he wanted to join, but his wife and son said to him, you join that church, you'll have nothing to do with me. We will have nothing to do with you. Um, and so he wrote to Brigham Young and said, Brigham, this is my predicament. What would the Lord have we do? Does he want me to join the church? And Brigham's answer was, 
yes. And uh, Truman Madsen's great-great-grandfather joined the church and his wife and son were true to their word. They left him. What? What is the Lord going to ask of us to give up, to go to Zion? Uh, these were the thoughts that I had. Sorry, I'm I'm here. I just had someone hit their head on the desk. Can so, you hear me, boy? Can you get yep. me? Um, Micah, would you mind going next and then I'll circle back? Yep. Thanks. Yep. Let me just pick up my mic. Okay. So now I have to scroll down. Okay. This is one of the most, uh, the, the section of part one that I, you know, this is Micah's opinion. Right, I have to clearly say that this is just my opinion that was the most important. This is the, one of those sections where if you just read over it quickly, you might not realize what is actually being said. And we do this a lot in the scriptures when we don't realize the the, the opposite, right? We, we we like to ex, you know accept one aspect of it, but we don't uh, we don't understand that there's a reverse of that, right? So, um, you know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, keeping the commandments, you're blessed, right? Well, well, wickedness never was happiness. But we, we we don't like a lot of the times to say, well, that means that wickedness is misery. And we don't like to do that. And this is one of those cases where there is something in here that we really need to think about. We need to stop and read this until we actually uh, understand what's being said here. And uh, it's this line right here. Um, um, unless they, so this is us as members of the church specifically, because we're the ones that know this, unless we have members have an actual knowledge that the course that we are on and that we're pursuing is in according to the will of God. So if we don't know that, we as members will grow, we, listen to this, weary in our, our minds and we will faint. And this, and, and listen to what happens after this, for such has been and always will be, okay? So that's pretty powerful, pretty powerful language. Um, and, and so we need to think about that for one second. If we as members uh, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, if we right now are not are not doing what the Lord has asked us to do, and we know it, we must surely, quote, grow weary in our minds and faint, end quote. Or another way you could say this is fall asleep. When you faint, you fall asleep. As we learned in the previous lectures, the first way we learn is by human testimony, and then we work out from there, right? In other words, the, the scripture that really sums that up is Romans chapter, uh, Romans uh, verse 14 here. Um, quote, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed, and how shall they believe in whom, uh, in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher, end quote. And I would also say verses 15 through 21 of that same chapter are also amazing. Okay, well, we as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we've had a preacher. We've had teachers. The Lord told us. In Doctrine and Covenants chapter 101, we read, quote, A certain nobleman had a spot of land, very choice, and he said unto his servants, Go ye unto my vineyard, even upon this very choice piece of land and plant 12 olive trees and set watchmen round about them and build a tower that one may overlook the land round about to be a watchman upon the tower that mine olive trees may not be broken down when the enemy shall come to spoil and take upon themselves the fruit of my vineyard, meaning it's going to happen. But what did we do? Continuing in Dr. Gummins chapter 101, quote, now the servants of the nobleman went and did as the Lord commanded them and planted the olive trees and built a hedge round about and set watchmen and began to build a tower. And while they were yet laying the foundation thereof, they began to say among themselves, then what need hath my Lord of this tower? And consulted for a long time, saying among themselves, what need hath my Lord of this tower? Seeing this is a time of peace. 
Might not this money be given to the exchangers, for there is no need of these things? And while they were at variance one with another, they became very slothful, and they hearkened not unto the commandments of their Lord. So they rejected the original command. So what was the effect of this? Continuing in Doctrine Covenants 101, and the enemy came by night and broke down the hedge, and the servants of the noblemen arose and were affrightened and fled, and the enemy destroyed their works and broke down the olive trees. Now behold, the noblemen and the lord of the vineyard called upon his servants and said to them, Why? What is the cause of this great evil? Ought ye not to have done even as I commanded you, and after ye had planted the vineyard and built the hedge round about and set watchmen upon the walls thereof, built the tower also, and set a watchman upon the tower and watched for my vineyard, and here's the key, and not have fallen asleep, lest the enemy should come upon you. And behold, the watchman upon the tower would have seen the enemy while he was yet afar off. And then you could have made ready and kept the enemy from breaking down the hedge thereof and saved my vineyard from the hands of the destroyer. As President Benson so clearly put it, quote, my dear brethren and sisters, we must prepare to redeem Zion, end quote. Now, if we ignore this, what do we know will happen to us? We will have feared man more than God. We will not be increasing in confidence, etc., etc. We will have grown weary in our minds and fainted. We will have fallen asleep. We read in 2 Nephi chapter 27, quote, For behold, the Lord has poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep. For behold, ye have closed your eyes, and ye have rejected the prophets and your rulers, and the seers hath he covered because of your iniquity. The ten virgins also ties into the same concept and time period. We learn here in lecture six, while this sleep has fallen upon us, we know the mind and will of God. So we learn here in lecture six why this sleep has fallen upon us. So a lot of people ask like, why? Why did this happen to us? This is why. You can't know the mind of God. You can't know the course that we're supposed to be walking on and say, nah, I'm not going to do it without this being the, uh, the, the, the natural uh, consequence that we will grow weary in our mind and we will faint. We know the mind and will of God and we have acted in rebellion against his will, seeking out our own will over that of the Lord and thus have been cut off from his light and truth. We will not gain the power again until we awaken and live according to that which the Lord has commanded us. In Doctrine and Covenants chapter 113, verses 7 and 8, we read, Question by Elias Higby, what is meant by the command in Isaiah 52nd chapter, first verse, which saith, Put on thy strength, O Zion, and what people had Isaiah reference to? Well, he had reference to those whom God should call in the last days who should hold the power of priesthood to bring again Zion and the redemption of Israel. And to put on her strength is to put on the authority of the priesthood, which she, Zion, has a right to by lineage, also to return to that power which she had lost. <coughs> so, if we awake and arise, what do we do to prepare for such a redemption and return to lost power. <clears> Third <throat> Nephi, chapter 24, verses 16 and 17. And they that feared the Lord, there it comes back again, feared in the Lord, spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard, and the book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord, and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. And we are back to fearing the Lord according to his precepts. But it mentions here that they spake often one to another. So let's round out that understanding by turning to Doctrine and Covenants chapter 101, verses 12 and 13. And in that day, all who are found upon the watchtower, or in other words, all my in Israel, they're the same thing, those on the watchtower. And when the Lord refers to Israel, they're the same thing. If you're not on the watchtower, you're not Israel, shall be saved. And they that have been scattered shall be gathered. In the Doctrine and Covenants 88, we read, Behold, I sent you out 
to testify and warn the people. And it becometh every man who hath been warned to warn his neighbor. Therefore they are left without excuse and their sins are upon their own heads. He that seeketh me early shall find me and shall not be forsaken. Therefore tarry ye and labor diligently that you may be perfected in your ministry to go forth among the Gentiles for the last time. As many as the mouth of the Lord shall name to bind up the law and seal up the testimony and to prepare the saints for the hour of judgment, which is to come that their souls may escape the wrath of God, the desolation of abomination, which awaits the wicked, both in this world and in the world to come. Verily, I say unto you, let those who are not the first elders continue in the vineyard until the mouth of the Lord shall call them. And why are they being called? To redeem Zion. For their time is not yet come. Their garments are not clean from the blood of this generation. All right, Kelly, you ready? I am. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So to to follow um, that, my my thoughts were <laughs> President Howard W. Hunter said, God knows what we do not know, and he sees what we do not see. So we do not know in advance exactly how he would get us from where we are to where we need to be. But we have faith that he will get us there. So we encounter many bumps, bends, and forks. There's a lot of teaching and correcting as we travel on that road. But President Faust encourages us as we live on earth, we must walk in faith, nothing doubting. When the journey becomes unbearable, we can take comfort in the words of the Lord. And I think this applies to everyone who is just crying out in their hearts for the redemption of Zion. And the Lord says, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. And it says, we may never know why some things happen in this life. But President Brigham Young offered this insight when he said, we have much reason to hope. Joy can be ours if we are willing to sacrifice all for the Lord. Then we can look forward to the infinitely priceless possibility of overcoming all the challenges of this life. Then we will be with the Savior forever, anticipating the glory, excellency, and exaltation that God has prepared for us, the faithful. All done. All right. Well, thank you. So we're going to go on to um, the next one, which is number five, paragraph five. Should be coming up on our screen in a sec. And I will read it. Quote, for a man to lay down his all, his character his, and reputation, his honor and applause, his good name among men, his houses, his lands, his brothers and sisters, his wife and children, and even his own life also counting all things but filth and dross for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ requires more than mere belief or supposition that he is doing the will of God, but actual knowledge, realizing that when the sufferings are ended, he will enter into eternal rest and be a partaker of the glory of God, end quote. Okay, um, very powerful here. One of the um, myths that has grown up in the church is that if a person, family member, if they are rich and successful and they, they excel in business or are the top leaders, then they're obviously following the Lord. Um, uh, and I know if I go back a number of years I really struggled for a while because I'd hear 
through the scriptures and through um, a lot of talks that uh, family comes first, that uh, no other success can compensate for failure in the home. Um, to be a righteous father is good. But then I'd go to priesthood leadership meetings over and over again, and you'd hear missionary stories, and it would be, oh, I was in an airport and I spoke to a guy and I said, you look like a Mormon bishop. And he said, oh, I don't even know what a Mormon is. And he joined the church and four years later he was a Mormon bishop. And uh, then there'd be another story about, oh, I met this guy and and two years later he was a, a, a state president or a, a mission president. Or And it seemed to me at the time that all the uh, – this would be over a number of five years or more um, – all these missionary stories ended in a person being very in some sort of high leadership calling. And I, I really struggled with the Lord. And I said, Heavenly Father, what is the story here? Is it is it leadership, what I'm supposed to be choosing, or am I supposed to be a righteous father? Is that the highest call? Because it's not what I'm hearing. I don't hear this. And then it's also, you know, if you notice over the last, well, um, 30-odd years, but it certainly goes longer than that. Um, being the father, being father ahead of the home and being a mother in the home uh, has, in the church, is less and less important. It's taught less and less, and so I really struggle with him. Right? Eventually he gave me an answer. Um, I was attending a priesthood leadership meeting. Uh, with the ones they, they broadcasted, they haven't done it for a while, but they used to broadcast them. And uh, at the end, President Hinckley got up and he said, okay, this has been really good. President, I want to talk to you straight. He said, all these things are great. Becoming a good leader is great. But in the end, you need to be a father. You need to take care of your wife and your children. You need to learn. That's what the eternal life is. And the spirit just came down upon me so strong. Um, it was just so powerful that this is the answer to your prayer. You might hear all these other things, but in the end, you, you've got to come the family. That's what it's about. And how do you become uh, a good father, in my case, and a good husband? Is I need to come unto Christ. I need to be like him. I need to do what he says. And all the things we're learning, increasing in faith and, and helping others. So coming down to this, for a man to lay down his all, so, and this almost seems like a contradiction. Hang on, I've got to be a good father and mother. And the example I gave earlier on about uh, Truman Madsen's, uh, he had to give up his wife and his child. Um, it, when all said and done, if I'm going to be a good husband and a good father in the eternities, I need to follow Christ. And it sounds, from my previous discussion, I was saying it, it sounds really hard, and it is really hard. However, once you meet the trials that the Lord has given to you, once you uh, go through those difficulties and you do what the Lord says you to do, the joy, the blessing, the understanding, the knowledge, what he gives you far outweighs the difficulty that you have to go through. But you will never know the blessing unless you go through the difficulty. If you don't meet the challenge and you turn away from it, um, you'll never know. So those who don't achieve exaltation will never know what it's like. They won't know how good it is. Only those who do what the Lord, who believe him to exercise faith and gain knowledge and become like him will do that. Um, and so it's really interesting to me that the sacrifice of all things, and, and this will be covered in the next six ones more detail, but I can't, this sort of points to it. It's the sacrifice of all things that actually is required for us to be able to go through that, to be to have enough faith to gain exaltation, so to become an exalted being. So it's not something that you you actually go and all right, well then I'm going to go and uh, achieve this. I'm going to do this. The Lord will send to you the trials that you need to have, so that you can become a celestial being. For Abraham, it was to sacrifice his son, but he didn't have to go through that. I suggest that for Nephi, part of it was to kill Laban. Now, he had to go through with that. Um, and for each different person, but the Lord knows what's right for you, and you will get your own sacrifice. Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 31. 
This one thing is sure, that they who will live God, godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecutions, and before their robes are made white in the blood of the Lamb, it is to be expected, according to John, the revelator, that they will pass through great tribulations. And in page 42, we have all been children and are too much at present, we, but we hope in the Lord that we may grow in grace and be prepared for all which in the bosom of futurity may time is rapidly rolling on. The prophecies must be fulfilled. The days of tribulation are fast approaching and the time to test the fidelity of the saints has come. Rumour and her 10,000 tongues is diffusing her uncertain sound in almost every ear. But in these times of sore trial, let the saints be patient and see the salvation of God. Those who cannot endure persecution and stand in the day of affliction cannot stand in the day when the Son of God shall burst the veil and appear in all the glory of his Father with all the holy angels. Um, it's worth it, but we've got to endure. And what the Lectures on Faith are teaching us is that if we have a knowledge that the course of life in which we are pursuing is according to God's will, then we will be able to bear the trials that come. And it's through the bearing the trials that come that sanctifies us, that purifies us, um, that enables the Saviour through his atonement to sanctify our bodies that they may become celestial bodies. And there's a whole process here at the moment of understanding that it, um, in the, in the pre-earth life, we progressed as far as we were going to progress or willing to progress. And then we were given the opportunity to come to earth. The major reason for us, there's, there's several reasons, but one of the major reasons for us being here upon the earth is to, for us as an individual, Joseph Secluna, I, my intelligence, my spirit, for me to train my body to be a celestial body. I need to have, my spirit needs to have control over my body. And this is why um, um, uh, addictions and all that are so damning because you're allowing your body to control your spirit. If your body's controlling your spirit, then depending on the level that it has will determine whether you're a telestial, terrestrial or celestial being. So for an exalted being, we need to have control over our bodies. And so the, the the experiences that we have in this life, and this is why sacrifice of all things is so important, it's that experience in the body that enables us to have the faith and the ability to become a celestial being so that in the resurrection our spirit is able to bring our bodies back out of the grave through the resurrection of Christ and his power, but our spirits will then be able to be a celestial body because it will change. Um, continuing on, teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, page 251. The enemies of this people will never get weary of their persecution against the church until they are overcome. I expect that they will array everything against me that is in their power to control and that we shall have a long and tremendous warfare. He that will war the true Christian warfare against the corruptions of these last days will have wicked men and angels of devils and all the infernal powers of darkness continually arrayed against him. When wicked and corrupt men oppose, it is a criterion to the judge if a man is warring the Christian war. When all men speak evil of you falsely, blessed are ye. Shall a man be considered bad when men speak evil of him? No. If a man stands and opposes the world of sin, he may expect to have all wicked and corrupt spirits array against, against, arrayed against him. Um, so when you look around and you see other people and they lose their wealth, they lose their businesses, they have problems in their family, they 
be careful to not judge um, unrighteously. This could be the trials that the Heavenly Father is using to sanctify these people to become exalted beings. And so when everything falls apart in your life uh, and 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 the wicked use, uh, you know, they don't play fair. Satan doesn't play by the rules. Um, and so he will uh, encourage his followers to not play by the rules and they'll do whatever they can to bring you down. But know this, that God is more powerful than Satan, that the Saviour will not leave us alone and that through these experiences we can come unto Christ, we can receive our calling and election made sure, we can be prepared to redeem Zion and we can have that uh, wonderful experience of being called by Joseph Smith um, to go forth and do this work. And even at that point, it's not going to be a, a – we're not going to all jump in um, our Cadillac or what is it, Mercedes-Benz or, or have a cruise down to uh, um, Jackson County, Missouri. You know, we're still going to have to exercise faith. It's still going to be um, the, 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 um, the Assyrians not going to give up. They're going to keep going and going and going. And that's why the, the, the Lord or Joseph wants a group of people who, are, who have been put through the ringer, who have been tested and are shown truthful and, and will stand up for all things. Then he knows he'll have a, a group who will go with him and not shy backwards from the work that needs to be done. These were the thoughts that I got from that paragraph. So we had similar similar thoughts to that, and I really appreciate the testimony and the words that you had as part of that. Um, we we took our response from a talk given by President Irene, and he said, "In the depths of his anguish in Liberty Jail, the Prophet Joseph Smith cried out, Oh God.'" Where art thou? And where is the pavilion that covereth thy hiding place? And President Irene said, The pavilion that seems to intercept divine aid does not cover God, but occasionally covers us. God is never hidden, yet sometimes we are covered by a pavilion of motivations that drive us away from God and make him seem distant and inaccessible. Our own desires, rather than a feeling of thy will be done, create the feeling of a pavilion blocking God. And I feel like this phrase is really important. He said, God is not unable to see us or communicate with us, but we may be unwilling to listen or submit to his will and his time. Our feelings of separation from God will diminish as we become more childlike before him. And he said, this is not easy. In a world where the opinions of others can have such an effect on our motives. But we will learn this truth. God is close to us and aware of us and never hides from his faithful children. And he adds this really touching story and he said one of my daughters-in-law spent many years feeling that God had placed a pavilion over her. She was a young mother of three who longed for more children. After two miscarriages her prayers of pleading grew anguished. 
As more barren years passed, she felt tempted to anger. When her youngest went off to school, the emptiness of her house seemed to mock her focus on motherhood. So did the unplanned and even unwanted pregnancies of others. She felt as committed and consecrated as Mary, who declared, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord. But although she spoke these words in her heart, she could hear nothing in reply. And he says her husband invited her to go on a business trip. While there, her heart ready to burst, she prayed aloud. And for the first time, she didn't ask for another child, but for a divine Aaron. She said, I will give you all of my time. Please show me how to fill it. She expressed her willingness to take her family wherever they might be required to grow. That prayer produced an unexpected feeling of peace. It did not satisfy her mind's craving for certainty, but for the first time in years, it calmed her heart. And I would just challenge all of those that are listening um, to the fireside or reading the paper to really think about can we approach Heavenly Father and truly say, I will give you everything. Show me how to fill it. And Elder Irene finishes with submitting fully to heaven's will is essential to removing the spiritual pavilions that we sometimes put over our heads. And that's my part. All right. Thank you both. <clears throat> now, this language taken from um, this part in the lecture um, is is almost assuredly taken from the wording found in Philippians 3, which I've already read earlier in the, in the lecture. So I just wanted to add a little context at this part now for people who might not know Paul and what Paul actually had to suffer so that when we read Philippians 3, We'll know that Paul isn't preaching idle words, but he's preaching from real experiences his, with real suffering. So for that, a little glimpse of that, we can get it from his own mouth in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Quote, of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day have I been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness and watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I? I angered not, I anger not. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king kept the city of Damascus with a garrison desirous to apprehend me. And through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. End quote from the scriptures. So he had a few things that he had to go through. Um, <clears throat> so let's go to the very last one here. Number six, last paragraph that we're going over today in lecture six. Should be coming on our screen shortly. 
And it reads, quote, for unless a person does uh, know that he is walking according to the will of God, it would be offering an insult to the dignity of the creator were he to say that he would be a partaker of his glory when he should be done with the things of this life. But when he has this knowledge and most assuredly knows that he is doing the will of God, his confidence can be equally strong that he will be a partaker of the glory of God, end quote. This is so important. I'm glad you just read those uh, scriptures, Micah. <laughs> I don't know um, if I can do it yet, but I, my plan is that I'd like to sit at the table with Abraham, with uh, with Paul, but uh, I can't imagine um, going and sitting at the table with Paul in in, uh, in Zion or, or in the eternities. And uh, how did you go on earth? And then Paul lists off all these things. Oh, yeah, well, you know, I lived in Australia and we had, uh, yeah, pretty easy life and we didn't have any wars and we didn't have this and that. But it was really tough. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't work. <laughs> just doesn't work, does it? Um, and so even though we haven't had the wars, you know, I have been through a few more trials and that. It's not come up to him yet. However, the Lord knows what we need to be able to feel confident that we can um, uh, sit at the table with these men and and women, um, and so that. But that's the important thing here. I think is is, is that all of the thing that we've gone over the in the in the, the fire side so far. It's that submission to God. It's that willingness to do whatever He asks us to do, and having that knowledge and continually praying. Um, I feel to share. So my wife and I in our prayer this morning. Um, we were asking, uh, we've received some more light and knowledge on the path that we need to go. And so we were asking uh, for specific direction on what we need to do. And as part of the answer, the answer was that day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, and second by second, we need to ask the Lord what he wants us to do. And if I can do that 20, well, all my waking hours and and uh, my waking hours are the hours that he wants me awake and I'm always doing his will, no matter what it is, then I can be assured um, that I am doing, uh, I, can have, I can have that knowledge and have that assurance and that confidence that what I'm doing, where I'm placing my time, my effort, my thoughts, my th are according to his will. I have that prayer in my heart. I'm asking the Lord. Guidance by guidance. Joseph Smith taught, page 331, I have tried a number of years to get the minds of the saints prepared to receive the things of God, but we frequently see some of them, after suffering all they have for the work of God, will fly to pieces like glass as soon as anything comes that is contrary to their traditions. They cannot stand the fire at all. How many will be able to abide the celestial law and go through and receive their exaltation? I am unable to say. As many are called, but few are chosen. And it's so sad when, when uh, to think that he's talking about the saints who, you know, mobs persecuted them, run out of homes, they've given up their families, they've done all sorts of stuff. But then the Lord comes and says, oh, by the way, um, you have to live the law of consecration. Oh, what? I've got to do that? No, nah, no, nah, I can't do that. Oh, and also, by the way, I want you to live celestial marriage, which actually means that a man has more than one wife. Oh, you're joking. I can't do that. So, like They don't even actually go through the test. They've been through so much and yet knowledge. What is going to be revealed to us when Joseph Smith returns? He's made it very clear, as you read through the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, it's, it's abundantly clear. He has been thwarted over and over and over again to actually share with the saints what he wants to know. I was reading, I don't think it's in these ones, this morning I was reading it, and he goes, oh, I guess because of who I'm speaking to, I can only use the Bible, I can't use anything else, so I'll just teach you from the Bible. I wish he could just teach from his heart. 
so that he could tell us what the angels and God has revealed to him clearly. And I believe he, that's what he will do when he comes back, because when he reinstitutes celestial law, we'll have what we've had and more truths will be ex expanded upon and we'll have more understanding. Will we, after all of the trials we've been through to that point, will we accept what he says? That's what we need to be preparing for. In page 324 to 25, Joseph said, all men know that they must die, and it is important that we should understand the reasons and causes of our exposure to the vicissitudes of life and of death and the designs and purposes of God in our coming into the world, our sufferings here and our departure hence. What is the object of our coming into existence, then dying and falling away, to be here no more? Is it but reasonable to suppose that God would reveal something in reference to the matter? And is and it is a subject we ought to study more than any other. We ought to study it day and night, for the world is ignorant in reference to their true condition and relation. If we have any claim on our Heavenly Father for anything, it is for knowledge on this important subject. Could we read and comprehend all that has been written from the days of Adam on the relation of man to God and angels in the future state, we should know very little about it. Reading the experience of others or the revelation given to them can never give us comprehensive view, give us a comprehensive view of our condition and our true relation to God. Knowledge of these things can only be obtained by experience through the ordinances of God set forth for that purpose. Could you gaze into heaven five minutes? You would know more than you would by reading all that ever was written on the subject. Hence our reason to, to gain our calling election made sure and then to sit the second comforter. But notice this also. Um, it's... Knowledge of these things can only be obtained by experience through the ordinances of God set forth for that purpose. As we participate in the ordinances um, and live celestial law as much as we can to this point, we receive revelation, we receive faith, knowledge, faith, knowledge, revelation from God, and we do gain our own experiences so that we can become more confident. That's what this whole fireside has been about, is how do you increase in that knowledge so that you can be confident and have an assurance before God? And whilst the ultimate goal is um, the second comforter, the journey to the second comforter is very important, and that what will continue is to increase in, in uh, assurance and in confidence so that we can achieve that. And then we will get to the point where we can gaze into heaven for five minutes for more and learn and be revealed uh, to uh, more will be revealed to us. Continuing on the quote from Joseph Smith, we are only capable of comprehending that certain things is, exist, which we may acquire by a certain fixed principles. If men would acquire salvation, they have got to be subject before they leave this world. to certain rules and principles which were fixed by an unalterable decree before the world was. So I would think it's important that we need to, while we're here in this life, understand what those certain rules and principles which were fixed and unalterable decreed before the world was. If we don't understand that and have that in this life, then how can we acquire, and when he talks about salvation here, he's also talk, he's talking about exaltation. We can't achieve exaltation unless we do in this life what needs to be done. And he continues, the disappointment of hopes and expectations at the resurrection would be indescribably dreadful. How sad it will be if we think we're going to be exalted and, and live as God lives, sit with Paul and talk about the days on earth, 
or Abraham, etc. We think we're going to do that, but when we get there, we're not. That, that's that's a, a pain I don't want to achieve. Um, uh, so my desire is is to hear the word of the Lord, to exercise faith, to gain knowledge, to do the will of the Lord, and continue that cycle over and over and over again, receiving the revelation, participating in the ordinances, in the temple and that sacrament, and continuing on, feasting upon the words of Christ, doing all these things, having a, a, a belief which turns into a knowledge and knowing, listening to the Spirit day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, second by second, that I may know that I am doing the will of the Lord. And as more and more of us continue to know that we are doing the will of the Lord, we will be prepared to answer the call to redeem Zion. This is my testimony, and I share it with all. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 So I'll go ahead and finish with our last thoughts and very similar uh, to what's been shared. We found a talk by President M. Russell Ballard and the entire talk is amazing and it's actually called, Is It Worth It? And he said, we must be willing to establish in our minds this fact. In order to be great in whatever we attempt to do in life, we have to decide in advance that it is all worth it. And when we read that phrase, you know, it was like, in order to be great in the redemption of Zion, we have to decide in advance that it's all worth it and he said have you set your priorities are they solidly and clearly defined in your minds were they clear when you got up this morning and will they be clear tomorrow morning and each morning and from the other passage, I would say, is that clear in your mind, hour by hour, day by day? And he said, what I would like to convey to you is that we have a great destiny, a great challenge, and a great work to do. Our ultimate goal is that the Lord has given us scriptures to know it is worth it. And he encouraged in this talk for those saints to read Doctor and Covenants 26. And when we were prepping for this fireside, we went through and we listed out all the promises and blessings and contained in Doctrine and Covenants 76. And at the bottom of it, it was just this overwhelming, like feeling of love of our Heavenly Father that He has for us. And it is worth it. And President Ballard says, you need to have this in your mind. It is worth it. I am not going to compromise. I am not going to shortcut. I am going to commit myself all the way because it is worth it. And he tells of his grandfather and when his grandfather was an apostle, he had seen the Savior and he was actually embraced and blessed by the Savior. And he said, oh, if I could live worthy, though it would require four score years, so that in the end, when I have finished, 
I could go into his presence and receive the feeling that I then had in his presence. I would give everything that I am and ever hope to be. That is what we are trying to do. That's where we're trying to go. We are trying to qualify for that blessing and that honor. And we wanted to end with giving some commitments to anyone who will listen to this fireside or read the paper. Ponder the phrase, what does it mean for you and your family to decide in advance that it is all worth it? Are you willing to give everything that you are and ever hope to be? Are you willing today, this very moment, hour by hour, day by day, to covenant with God that you will pay the price? We know that as you covenant to give everything and to pay the price that your life and eternal progression will never be the same. You will be changed and you will have an ever burning desire to obey God's commands and sacrifice everything in any way you will. And we say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you both for what you've added to this fireside to the understanding of uh, lecture on faith six um, part one. I want to, uh, in my closing uh, thoughts on this, I want to bring this back to the redemption of Zion again, not just because it is singly the most important thing for saints to prepare for, but because it provides an example that will bring the principles taught in this lecture into clear focus. If, We are not preparing and doing all we can to bring about Zion. It would be offering an insult to the dignity of the, it would be offering an insult to the dignity of the creator were he to say that he would be a partaker of his glory when he should be done with the things of this life, end quote. That was what was just said. So brothers and sisters, be watchmen on the tower, or in other words, All mine Israel, saith the Lord. As we become watchmen on the tower and walk the walk, the Lord has laid out for us, as we walk the walk, the Lord has laid out for us, we will develop this faith. We will wax stronger and stronger in confidence and be filled with the love of God. We will obtain faith as the brother of Jared. The Lord promised, quote, there has been a day of calling, but the time has come for a day of choosing. And let those be chosen that are worthy. And it shall be manifest unto my servant by the voice of the Spirit, those that are chosen, and they shall be sanctified. And inasmuch as they follow the counsel which they receive, they shall have power after many days to accomplish all things pertaining to Zion. End quote. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. All right. Well, let's, uh, right, let's close with a prayer and um... okay. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for the opportunity we have uh, the technology and that it all worked well, um, that we're able to communicate all over the world. Um, as thou has said, um, we'll pour out the power of the Lamb of God upon your saints uh, all over the world. And we're we're grateful for that as that is continuing to grow. We're grateful for um, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for his atonement. We're thankful for Joseph Smith and the head of being the head of this dispensation and the one who holds the keys and will direct us and guide us to to Zion. Uh, We're thankful for the lectures on faith and pray that they'll bless us and help us to understand and grow and receive revelation as we study these and learn more about them. 
that we may uh, increase in faith and have the faith as a brother, brother of Jared um, by rending the veil of unbelief. And most of all, Father, we pray that they'll um, help us to help others to make the redemption of Zion the focus of our lives so that we may be prepared um, for the events of the second coming of the Saviour, that we can um, help this come about. We ask for thy guidance and, and the, the inspiration that we may know thy will and do thy will. And uh, again, we thank thee that we're able to um, have these firesides and are grateful for uh, Micah and Ashley for the effort and time they put into it. Pray that they'll bless them and bless all those who are listening uh, to take the time they've taken to, to participate in this both now and later. And we offer this prayer and close the fireside in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, thank you, Joseph, and thank you, Ryan and Kelly. I, we always kind of connect those two together. They're a tag team. Um, uh, thank you for the time you, you took to do this. I know that these lectures on faith are important, and I'm, I'm just so grateful that there are others that are willing to learn these things. This isn't, you know, as I've said a million times, there's no such thing as deep doctrine. There's just revealed or unrevealed, and this is revealed doctrine. This is stuff that we have at our fingertips, and the, we, we're required to learn it. And uh, we shouldn't view it as a burden, because when we learn these things and we live according to them, it, it blesses our life uh, immensely. And we can then remember uh, these, not re learn, remember these promises uh, that were promised to the house of Israel, and then we can make ourselves worthy. We can sanctify ourselves and make ourselves worthy so that we can participate in these events too. And so I'm really grateful for that. So thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Ryan and Kelly for that. Uh, it was awesome. You're very welcome. Yes. So, it's to be here. Thank you. Sorry. So I was just going to share really quick this funny story that actually happened yesterday that uh, reminded me how to be childlike. So in um, the United States, we were supposed to be able to see the aurora borealis or like the northern lights because of the solar flare or something like that. I don't I don't remember exactly. Um, but my husband came and he really excited, said, quick, grab all the kids. We've got to come outside to see this. And my little six year old, she's so sweet. She ran, grabbed her backpack, which is like her play equivalent of like a 72 hour kit. And she goes, I'm ready. Is Jesus here? And we were like, that's what I need. I need to be like that. And it was, it was so touching because we had just gone over this lecture and you're right. I mean, like, this is something that we can teach to children and we need to be taught it frequently. And I didn't put it as part of the fire side, but I was like, I want to jump out the front door with my bag full of stuffed animals, just hoping, you know, that the redemption of Zion is here. So, yeah, we can all be that way. Be childlike. <laughs> Yeah, it goes a lot with um, you know, it's generation. Our children are going to go into Zion, um, and so they're, they're, it's going to they're going to be amazing. I have a six year old boy, and I also have older children. We get together Sunday um, for dinners, and so two Sundays ago, uh, my older daughter, who's twenty two, said to my six year old son. He likes to do Just Dance and dance in front of the TV and said, next week we'll get, because they've done it in the past, next week we'll get together and we'll do Just Dance. And he goes, yeah, yeah, that's great. And then during the week he says to me, Dad, um, is Just Dance something, just, no, he said, Just Dance is not something we should actually do on Sunday, is it? I said, well, no, it's not really. He said, but not all your siblings have the same belief. Yeah. What do you think I should do? I said, well, why don't you ask the Lord? And so he said a beautiful prayer and asked Heavenly Father, um, should he do Just Dance with his sister on Sunday? 
And after the prayer, I said, how did you feel? And he goes, no, I don't think I should. It was just marvellous. So then on Sunday, well, for us, it's Monday here. So yesterday when we had uh, dinner, uh, she sat down next to him and she just he just turned to her and said, uh, Melissa, I don't think I want to do uh, dance, Just Dance today because it's Sunday. And it was so beautiful to have my younger son teach my older daughter to um, – but they're just, you know, they're just righteous, these young young saints that are coming down at the moment. It's lovely. Yeah. To be more childlike every day. That's what I yeah. need. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. So I probably won't stick around for questions. Um Sorry about earlier, my little girl bumped her head and then the dog wouldn't go with her to sleep. And then she was carrying the cat around that was screaming because it didn't want to be held by the six year old. So we were kind of kind of a disaster on mute. But um, <laughs> I do really, really appreciate uh, being on the fire site. So um, my love to everyone and we will um, see you again soon thank you Goodbye. thanks kelly yeah. and ron appreciate it yeah thank, thank you both have a good evening thanks bye it does take uh, a lot of time to do these and also put them together i mean we're two and a half hours into this just in the actual doing of it not the preparing for it so it's really great i'm really grateful for those that take the time to do this because it it is um it is i don't even know how to say it incalculably better uh when there's mo multiple people talking about a subject because you just you, it, it's harder to do things when you're alone and you also don't want to be a broken record and you don't want to be talking forever and so it's really nice when you can you can just pick the the as more specific uh, this is what i really feel like i want to talk about and then what you'll find um as joseph pointed out during the fireside that a lot almost all of the times there's only been a few times where like th that i will have want to say something and the other two hit it perfectly right they'll have gone another direction and so um you 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 create this symphony between you know you know three different sides of the triangle and then you can by the end of it you can really see what the triangle looks like and, and understand it and so um yeah, Zach, that's why I love these fire sites. And, and you know, I've I've actually studied lectures on faith for many, many years, but usually by myself. Most people I talk to about it and aren't really that interested. And so when I heard the first few fire sites of this, I just gained so much because having different perspectives, uh, it just allows Heavenly Father to give you revelation and understand so much better. Yeah. Love it. So far, we're on six part one. So I really enjoy doing these. And and the things that I found blue, like, and I've said this before, you know, so I'm, I'm preaching to a choir here at this point in time, but th some of the things that that post the Book of Mormon. So, you know, after reading the Book of Mormon and getting testimony, what were the, the, the things that changed my life? What were the books that influenced me the most? And um, the teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith and the lectures on faith are right up there, uh, you know, probably in the top five. And uh, like Joseph said, I've had the same experience. Uh, nobody wants to talk about the lectures on faith. And when they want to talk about them, it's typically in a negative light. Um, the same thing with the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. Nobody wants to talk about them. And when they do, it's typically a snippet, something taken out of context. And, and even by the way, and I don't want to offend anybody here, but this is just the truth. Even when apostles quote it. So, you know, Elder Bednar quoted um, uh, two different teachings of the prophet joseph smith in the, in the last um in the last conference and provided absolutely no context to it and so which makes it sound like joseph is saying something that he's really not so he for example this is so you can go look it up he uh he said that joseph smith on one occasion said that the greatest uh duty resting upon members is to preach the gospel and in another case he said the greatest responsibility resting on members is to seek after their dead and so and then he said joseph smith clearly thought that these two were exactly the same thing and provided absolutely no context for what was actually being said there or why Joseph said that. And so nobody wants to talk about the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. 
And when they do, they typically either want to talk about it in a negative light or they want to uh, take things out of context and, and not read in, in full context. And so another one of those examples is uh, they'll take the teachings of, of Joseph Smith and some of the Journal of Discourses and then they'll say, oh, see, it says here, completely out of context, it says here that, uh, you know, our personal revelation will supersede that of the the keys of the kingdom and, and we can ignore the counsel we're getting from um, the prophet. And man, have I gotten a lot of those. And what are they doing? They're just taking a single line out of something completely out of context and, and not giving any other uh, other information on it. And so, um, and so what we've tried to do with the lectures on faith and the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith is that we provide the entire quote. Here is the entire teachings of prophet quote. You can read it in this full context and let's talk about what it means. And, uh, you know, the one I was just thinking about with Joseph Smith was the one where it says that uh, uh, people were uh, depending on the uh, the prophet and, and um, hence were darkened in their mind because they were um, devolving or they were uh, neglecting the duties that were resting upon themselves. And they just take that one little line out of context and and just run with it. And uh, that's not what he was saying. Like what you're trying to make him say, that's not what he's saying. Read the entire quote in context and you'll go, oh, I know what he was saying. But uh, hmm. so I, I, I've i run into the same thing that Joseph said, uh, just said, but uh, with people not interested in the lectures on faith, not interested in the jo teachings of Prophet Joseph Smith. But I am telling you that if you want truth, if you're reading the Book of Mormon, for example, and you're just not, you're just not seeing it as the keystone of our religion. Like you're just not getting it. Read the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, and you will go back to the Book of Mormon, a changed individual. You will never read the Book of Mormon the same way because you will know why it's the keystone of our religion, and you'll know what it's trying to teach us and prepare us for. And um, it, it it will change your life. And so I love the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, and I love uh, the lectures on faith. Um, please read them, you know, please read them, please study them. Amen. Amen to everything you said. So, so true. And, and also the other one, which is a little bit harder, but, uh, I certainly like the reference is the history of the church. Um, it's amazing. What, what I find too, is a lot of people will quote stuff from manuals and some more recent stuff. But if you follow the trace back as to where they got it from, it's from the history of the church, the seven volumes. Um, and I don't, I don't know if anyone could help me here. I've got the uh, one by B.H. Roberts, but there was a six-volume one, which was the original one before B.H. Roberts redid it. I haven't been able to find a copy of that anywhere. You know, there might be. What's the one that's provided on Discord, the link that we have in – it for it is that when the, the I think original? that's BH Roberts one. That's BH as well? Darn. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I always got excited and went and had a look and then it was um which is good, but you know, BH Roberts is good and he did a lot of good job and 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 I understand, but every historian thinks they know better than the original historian. And they always make changes. You know, and nowadays it's just absolutely abominable what's happening with the historians in the church, what they're doing to, you know, I don't want to give them start on saints, but anyway, um, follow the references. And to talk about teachers of the prophet Joseph Smith, there's a quote, the quote in there very directly, the reason why Joseph Smith actually wrote or started writing the history of the church was to actually have a document, uh, some books that would counter um, oh, what was the name of that book again? By Dow. Mormonism um, Unveiled. Thank you. And and if you go into the saints, you actually go into ensign articles and you follow these crazy things about the 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 head in the hat and all these other things. So many of these references go back to Mormonism Unveiled and go back to um, David Whitmer and Martin Harris when they were apostates for 10, 15 years. And anyway. Yeah, I'd and, rather go to, to look yeah, on faith than that. Yeah, that was exactly why the book was written. And he also said that that if we had recorded all of the revelations that were given to us, we like almost all of the dis disputations that we were having right now, we wouldn't be having. But we got the revelations, 
and we just started acting, but then we didn't realize that other people wouldn't have the same things written down to be able to read them. And so there was this this first initial problem as the church grew, and it, it was now being introduced to members who weren't there when the revelations were given, when the teachings were given. You know, it's kind of like this 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 group that we have here, where it's like a new member will come in and we'll be saying things all the time, like, you know, uh, kick them in the eyes, and it, everyone will chuckle because they'll know what that has reference to, but the new people don't have any idea what's being said, and then there was no record kept, so that they could even go back and say, look, go back to this old revelation and you'll have the answer. And so this was written down for this purpose. This was the reason why, to settle disputations on doctrine. And so, and now we we basically throw it under the rug and say it doesn't have any importance. And uh, Matt here asked a question here and said, I don't get, I don't get why, uh, he said he was listening to a bunch of firesides and stuff with recent apostles and stuff. And uh, it doesn't seem like there was um, a support or a feeling of a, of a near term redemption of Zion and and he's wondering, why don't they say more? And why is there not a sense of urgency and, and yada, yada, yada? Well, I did read, to answer this, I did read the, the parable of the nobleman and the olive trees. And, and we need to understand that parable. And the second thing that I would ask is, is was Peter a good man? Was, was John a good man? Was James a good man? Were the original 11 apostles, you know, plus Matthias, were they good men? And people who who are familiar with my work know I love Peter and I defend him and I get upset when people take shots at him, you know, for for falling in the water because most members wouldn't even be in the boat. Mem people who are familiar with, with my work know that, right? I love Peter. These were phenomenal men, okay? But let me ask a question. Let me ask a question. In the Book of Mormon, when Jesus was over in the Americas and he taught that these people over in the Americas were the other sheep, the other sheep that he taught when he was in the Middle East, when he was over there with Peter, James, and John, and the original 11 plus Matthias, when he was teaching this over there. What did the Lord say was the reason why those men never knew about uh, the, the, the people over in the Americas? What did the the Lord, not Micah, not you know, uh, you know Joe up the street? What did Jesus have to say about why this knowledge was kept from the apostles in the old world? They didn't ask. They didn't have the faith. Didn't ask. They didn't have the faith, and uh, and the Lord wasn't very happy about it. So, the, once once again, we get into this um, where we we when the keys tell us to do something, we need to act. We need to jump when they tell us to act, but we don't profit worship, right? We, like, there's, a, there's a difference between that. So what, what your assumption is, is that they can't make, that, that, they're, that they're infallible, right? And, and, that's, and that's, so if you were in the Middle East and you were being taught uh, that, um, not being told to do something, once again, difference between doctrine and when the keys tell you to act. So you're being taught that the other sheep, you know, weren't in the Americas, right? That, that that wasn't the case. Was was Peter, James, and John, were they correct in teaching that over there in the Middle East, or were they not correct in teaching that? And, and the reason for that was because they never asked. They never asked. And so, um, so what am I getting at with this? I, you can believe that that President Nelson is a prophet of God with all of the keys and has them activated, right? We went over that in the, the Q&A of the last fireside. That was the new change in the temple question. We have to realize that the prophet has all the keys and they're active. Um, you can believe that. You can believe that all of those men are prophets, seers, and revelators with all the keys, uh, but they don't have them active, but President Nelson has them. You can believe all of that. And you can also believe, you can also at the same time believe that they all don't have the same vision of the future. That they don't, they don't all have this perfect vision of New Jerusalem. Like for example, President Eyring, with what, um, with what um, he's been saying, I can tell you, I know President Eyring has seen <clears throat> the New Jerusalem. I can promise you. 
that that man has seen it. He <clears throat> he has caught that vision and he knows it. <clears throat> but does that mean that every single one of them um, is even asking the question? I, I mean, do we know that, that 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 has even been the case? Do we know that uh, every single one of them, you know, pleads every single night and, and wants to know when the redemption of Zion is? Or maybe, maybe, because of everything else that's going on in the world, maybe they're praying about the temples reopening. Maybe they're praying about COVID. <coughs> you know, <coughs> maybe it's not on their mind. And that's... Um... And tying that in with what you've just said, I'm doing. Um, I'm going through uh, Isaiah and just really drilling down from your lectures and rewriting them for myself. So I got my own references in that. <laughs> you just read Isaiah one, and uh, it kind of gives you an idea of what's happening. Uh, not to mention um, the parable of the nobleman in one doctrine and covenants one hundred one. And as you said. You can hear these things through those scriptures of what's happening and why we are where we are um, without saying that the keys aren't active and this is the church of Jesus Christ. We know that's true. We know that the Lord is using this church. Uh, but there's a reason why Joseph Smith is coming back and there's a reason why he's coming out open. Um, and then he will clear things up. The boat is on its side. That's, that's life. Um, that was referencing Joseph's dream. Yeah, the steamboat. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and Isaiah just absolutely lays it out perfectly. <clears throat> yeah, I, he just he did, he lays it out perfectly. And we have to understand um, what our responsibility is. We, we, we know the church is true. We know that these men uh, have the keys of the kingdom and that they're active. Um, but... We also should know what's going to happen, what is happening in our future. And um, it is, it, and by the way, this is exactly what uh, Joseph Smith was talking about when he said people were relying entirely on the prophets and apostles. And because of the neglect resting of the, the duties resting on themselves, their minds have become darkened. This is what that has reference to. This is what, where, where people we'll get to a point in time where they will say, unless the prophet says something, I won't believe or do anything. And mm. that that's the problem. Where where the, the question shouldn't be, when the keys tell us to jump, should I jump? At that point in time, it should be just, how high do you want me to jump? The question really is, what do I do when the keys aren't talking? That's the That's the question. Because we know when the keys tell us to do something, we need to do. But when they're not talking, what do we do? Where do we spend our time? Where do we spend our time? What do we do? What do we say? You know, uh, what are we doing in our spare time? What are we believing in? What are we preparing for? You know, we can't go to the Lord and just say, you know, well, the prophets and apostles weren't, you know, seemingly very interested in this stuff. And therefore, uh, I didn't. I didn't think it was very important, so I didn't study it and prepare myself for it. You know, like th that. I'm sorry, that excuse just isn't going to cut it. And so, um, it's not going to cut it. And that, that's a summary of tonight's fireside, isn't it? Um, without a knowledge that we're doing the will of God, we we don't get that knowledge from the prophet. The prophet guides us as a church, and he tells us. And if the keys tells us to do certain thing, that's cool. But the rest of the time, hour by hour, minute by minute, second by second, what does the Lord want me to do? I can ask and he'll reveal it to me. We can know what Joseph knew as soon as we're ready to have it. He told us that. You know, yeah. and, and Fire and Ice just says here, I know of about around 500 saints that are praying night and day to be chosen to redeem Zion. And here's the thing mm -hmm. that, that, that also just kills me is that when saints will go, oh, I don't need to worry about it. Oh, I don't need to worry about it. You know, I just do my thing. And when the redemption of Zion happens and when these things take place, it'll just be great. Where have we ever, ever learned in the scriptures that we could just sit around and then the Lord will give us stuff that we don't desire, that, that we aren't asking him for? I mean, when the Lord taught us how to pray, he used examples like the importuning widow. 
where the widow would go to the judge and, and, and just at, pleaded with this judge over and over and over again until finally the judge was like, geez, I don't even like this woman. I don't even agree with her, but I'm going to give her what she's asking just to get rid of her. And then he used another example of the, the guy that went over in the middle of the night asking for bread or for food and, uh, you know, it woke him up and, and he was like, hey, hey, hook me up with some food until finally the guy was like, here, take the food and leave. And, and he said, this is how we should learn to pray and ask for things. And um, for what and, and what we heard, what, so that's what he taught. And what we heard was, oh, OK, I can just go merrily on my way and uh, all the good things are just going to fall out of heaven on my head. I, I don't I don't understand what they're what saints are reading. You know, if you're not praying and fasting to become a Zion people and to redeem Zion, what makes you think that it's just going to fall out of heaven on your head? Like what? I, I, I don't. And I mean that literally. I'm not saying that facetiously. I mean, literally, I don't understand what you're reading to, to be able to come to that conclusion. Like I. I, I because uh, everything that 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 the, I read from the Lord, the Lord requires something of me. The Lord, the Lord says, "Okay, you know, the brother of Jared. Okay, I get it. You want light in your boat, but guess what? I've already given you the answer, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give it to you. Go get it yourself. It's right down there. It's called your standard works, you know. And 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 that's always been the way the Lord works. And so, you know, we want the redemption of Zion. We want these things." You know, that's the first step. You have to have the desire, right? We, we actually learned that in the Doctrine and Covenants with regard to missionary work, where the Lord says, uh, I will give unto you this power if you desire it. He doesn't even say, like, if you're worthy. It, it, was, it was like, that wasn't the end, the end goal. It was if you're worthy and desire it. And so if we don't desire it, it's just there's nothing in the standard works that, 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 that leads to the belief that that's just going to fall out of heaven on us. And Joseph went through uh, the the New Jerusalem. He did a video on the New Jerusalem. And I love how he did this too, because this is another one of those things where like, I, I feel bad combating members on this because they really want to believe this. But it's like, I don't know where you're reading in the scriptures that New Jerusalem is going to be full of all kinds of people. Like, I don't know where you're really getting this. Maybe a, a quote from an apostle here, maybe a an opinion from a, a, a prophet other than Joseph Smith here but it's like you read the standard works and the the words of joseph smith and it is abundantly clear as joseph laid out in that video who is going to be in that city <coughs> and joseph is it going to be the wicked no, definitely not <laughs> not not even the, uh, the they have to be like-minded it's going to be celestial beings it's going to be righteous people calling election made sure <coughs> It's just crazy that they come up with these ideas. It sounds cute. It's, it sounds gentle. It sounds soft. And so they want to believe it. But it's like, I, I don't know what you're reading to come to that conclusion. There's nothing there. And I think you're right. They're not really reading much, are they? And and it's, it's this kumbaya type thing. Oh, we have to be kind. We have to be gentle. We have to be nice. And so, yeah, you can make mistakes. It's all right. You come in and be with me. Um, it, it really get, it gets up my goat, this, oh, I, I think I mentioned somewhere, I've travelled the world and I've met people and uh, they're really nice, they're kind and they're pure. And bottom line is, if you are not turned to the Lord and not obeying his commandments, which is participating in the ordinances, preparing for celestial law and living celestial law, then you are not pure in heart. I don't care what you say. You can give away all your goods you can do everything you want to do and, and serve your whole life, but if you don't turn to the Lord and to his uh, priesthood keys, his kingdom, the pure and unadulterated religion, as was mentioned there, then you're not going to be pure in heart. It can't happen. Yeah. And, yeah. Period. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, I, I love that you use, I think it's, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, like Dr. Govan's 84, where it's like people... People will say, oh, well, you're not supposed to judge the righteous from the wicked. That's not your job. And it's like, have you read the Doctrine and Covenants? J Jesus Christ gave us the single greatest key to do that. So why would he do that? Why would he say, I will give you this key of understanding so that you can, and he even says this, and by this, you can judge the wicked from, from the righteous. 
you know, just so people could turn around and say, yeah, he gave us that, but we're not supposed to use it. What? Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I. it's like him saying, here's a Lamborghini and here's the keys. And you're like, yeah, but we're not supposed to drive it. And it's like, uh, yeah. why? Like, he just gave it to us. You know, I, you yeah. know. And the Joseph Smith translations. I mean, you go back to Matthew. That's where they go. Is I think it's Matthew. Judge not that you shall not be judged. Well, hang on a minute. No, no, no. Read the Joseph Smith translation. Um, yeah. Don't judge unrighteously. You need to judge righteously. That's what you're supposed to do. Yes. How can you figure out right and wrong unless you judge? Yeah. It's and, like, oh. and somebody brought up, and I forget who it is, so forgive me, but somebody in Discord pointed out correctly that that what they don't understand when they remove judgment is that they remove mercy. And I thought this was a brilliant point because what is mercy? Mercy is judging somebody to be guilty and forgiving them. That, 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 is, literally what, that is what literally what mercy is. And so when you remove judgment, you destroy mercy. You can't show somebody mercy without first judging them. You have to ju judge them guilty and then show them mercy. That's terrific, yeah. Yeah, I like that. Man, I thought I thought that's a perfect way, and that just sums it up perfectly there. That was fantastic. But And so the, this is what I love about these firesides, about the Discord, about this group, is um, the coming, becoming one mind, uh, the, the getting together and understanding that this is truth, what's being talked. And, and I love that's always, here's the reference, here's the reference, here's the reference, because we've got to go by the word of God. Um, and so as we do that, because if we don't gain this unity, we will not redeem Zion and the world will be wasted. Yes. And we don't want that to happen. And that, that's, that's all upon us. It's not like that's what you were just saying. It's not um, someone else's responsibility. It's my responsibility. Yes. I need to do this. And that all of us need to feel that. And when there is enough, then the, uh, we, it'll happen. It'll come to, together. And that, uh, and, and that uh, being attached to the word of God, the iron rod, being attached to those words and using them. Um, you know, I've been, uh, you know, accused of, of pride because, you know, oh, you just love to use scriptures and, um, that, you know, you just study them because, you know, it's a pride thing. And I've had actually some people say that, um, that I remind them of missionaries that they had in their mission who knew the scriptures well, and they always thought they were prideful people. And and here's what's so crazy about that. First and foremost, you have to understand the definitions of pride a, a, because you're not using it right. And secondly, here's what's so crazy about it. The reason why I study the scriptures so much and, and I want to have references is, is because I know my words are worth less. That's the reason why. It's not because I think I'm great. It's because I know my words have, have no value outside of my home, right? It's not because of pride that I learned the scriptures. It's because I know that that my words mean nothing compared to the oracles. And so if, if I can't back it up with scripture, if I can't back it up with what I call the the, the, the pyramid of truth, right? You're, you have, you know, God, Jesus, the, the head of your dispensation and the keys, and you go down from there, but uh, if you don't, if you don't, if you know that you don't have that that value, and you're going after those things for that reason, that's the opposite of pride. You know, I, mm. I don't, I don't want to attach people to me. You know, I, 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 I love the fact that that there are people that can literally take my papers and regurgitate them exactly how they are, and people don't even realize that they're they're my papers. They don't even get it. Because I mm -hmm. you I didn't use anything you know that that would make that difficult right so they could just take the papers right on. Yep. Well, that, that's exactly where um, the New Jerusalem paper that I did with um, sins of rebellion and sins of wickedness that became so clear to me when reading one of your papers. Um, anyway, that's where I got it from. But you were just using scriptures, and then I, that's all I did was just use scriptures. It's not that's not my thought. It's not my who I am, uh, and that's that's really the power, isn't it? It's the power of the the, the prophets, the, what they say, what they write. Um, that's how we come to God. And you'll always be able to find a concert of clarity. I love how yes. I, I love how Bednar said that you will always be able to. Sometimes you will find single quotes, 
And some of them might be even really, really nice, right? They give you hope and peace, and you're like, oh, that sounds really nice. But if you can't find anything else that backs it up, you need to throw it out. <clears throat> yes, yeah, absolutely. And then the other thing that, that goes along with that too is uh, for us becoming one is – if we read, I like how you point out, you've got Joseph Smith. So he's the head of the dispensation, obviously the saver above him. But Joseph Smith, the, the writings and verified writings to that, then Brigham Young and others who are close to him and so forth. And if we don't understand what they've actually said, our first port of call should be, well, I need to ask the Lord to help me to understand. Whereas I hear so many people, oh, but Brigham Young said this, and that's a load of hogwash. Well, do you really under? Is it a small quote? Is it only part of what he said? Did you read the whole thing in context? And then, do you know what he was meaning? Um, and so, a lot of the things that I've come across where it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't fit into my what was the word they used? My uh, forefathers' teachings or what I already believe. I've had to park and wait, and invariably. I'll, one by one, the Lord opens my eyes, and then I can understand because me and every time, Joseph Smith, every time. It's, if I don't understand it, then they're right and I'm wrong. Yeah. Especially when there's a concert of clarity, as you said. Yeah, and there is, like I said, with some of these things like following the keys, when the keys tell you to jump, jump. There is such a concert of clarity of that going from Joseph Smith to today. I mean, just prophet after, including Joseph Smith, you know, including him. We have it in the Doctrine and Covenants. We have it in the Book of Mormon constantly. You have to follow the prophet. You have to follow the prophet. And then there's like two quotes that they take out of context, one from Brigham Young, one from Joseph Smith. And, and they say, oh, see, it's, you know, it's equal. No, it's not. You've taken two mm -hmm. things out of context. That is not a, a concert of clarity. You know, uh, you know, in Discord, in the the archives that uh, server that I have there, I mean, we've come up with I don't even know how many pages worth of just awesome quotes about following the prophets. You know, it just, just it doesn't end; it just keeps going and going and going. You know, concerts of clarity are real things. Yeah, and it's interesting too that like the keys are obviously people then will go, oh yeah, but the keys. Up the profit level, yeah, I'll wait that. Living in Australia, when's the profit ever going to tell me directly something other than from conference? Uh, but also my state president, my bishop, uh, my son Michael had a, uh, a powerful experience where, I won't go into all the details, but anyway, the state president called him in the office and called him to repentance for something he didn't really, do, well, he didn't do at all. And, and then he, the state president gave him direction on what he had to do to as a consequence of the sin which he was um, uh, accused of. And so he calls me and said, Dad, what do I do if I, if I I didn't do this? And the state president said, and I said, mate, you've got to follow the keys. If, if he's right and you're wrong, well, then you're blessed. But if you're right and he's wrong, you'll be blessed for following him. And to Michael's credit, he followed him. And, and Michael was right. It wasn't an issue. Uh, but that's not the issue. He followed the keys and the blessings that Michael received from that as the years rolled on, insurmountable. Um, so the Lord honours his priesthood leaders. Um, and if they, are, if they go astray, the Lord will re remove them. Yes. But yeah, we've got to follow the keys. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, though. Are there any more questions here? I'll tell you what, though, uh, a concert of clarity that I just can't not, um, I just can't not unsee is the redemption of Zion and the building of New Jerusalem. I, I just, yeah. once you see it, you understand, like I said, the keystone of our religion. The, the People don't understand. Th these are members of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They they read the Book of Mormon. They know it's true. They, they understand the 10th article of faith, which says that we believe that the new Jerusalem will be built future tense upon this American continent. Not that it will fall out of heaven, but that it will be built. This is our core, core, core doctrines. Number 10, we believe that the new Jerusalem will be built 
future tense upon this, the American continent. And uh, th that is the reason for the Book of Mormon. I, I can't stress that enough when I talk to people. Like, what is the purpose of the Book of Mormon? It is to get Joseph ready to build the new Jerusalem. That is it. That is that is the purpose for it. Because once we get that, the sealed portion comes out, and that is it encompasses the entire world. Once we get that, that encompasses the entire world. This book, if you've read that book and you have no comprehension of the redemption of Zion and the building of New Jerusalem, 3rd Nephi chapter 21, or starting in verse 20 and go to 25 where uh, Mormons, are, you know, bridging the Book of Mormon and, and, and Christ says, hey, you know, don't write anything further because I'm going to test the faith of my people. If you read to that point in time and you don't understand it, then you don't understand the Book of Mormon at all. It is, as Brother Hiram Andrus says, there's the sealed portion that we don't have, and then there's the sealed portion that we do have. And um, because its understanding is sealed to so many members. And and that is the, the, that is the purpose of that book. And as Brigham Young correctly pointed out, the guidebook to build Zion on how to do it is in the Doctrine and Covenants. And so the, the two books together is... This is to get Joseph ready, and the Doctrine and Covenants is how to do it. I mean, that's that. That's uh, the, those are the two books. And so, if you if you read the Book of Mormon and you read the Doctrine and Covenants, and you have no comprehension of the redemption and building of New Jerusalem, you have completely missed the mark. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And as the, what what I love too is that, as you said, with the Doctrine and Covenants as a as the uh, instruction manual, um, we do miss it so often. But it's there, and if you have eyes to see, the Lord will open it up. One other thing that's really important, and what's, what I love about this, as we're getting on this idea of the redemption of Zion, and we did Zion or bust, and but I think as a group of people, and as we're sharing with them, we have to get on exactly the same page. Um, I felt to share an experience, and I didn't know when the Lord wanted me to share it, but I'll share it now. I've, uh, I've served on a high council and I've had to go to uh, disciplinary councils. And I've sat on a few. And the stake presidency go off and, pray, like, the person will be there. They go out of the room. The stake presidency go and pray. They come back. They present it to the high council. You sustain it, and then you move on. And the person comes in, and you talk about what goes on. Only once did I have the experience where when the, first, when the stake presidency came back and presented their decision and why their decision was what their decision, all 16 men in the room we, sus we sustained it, and we were all on exactly the same page. We were all one. We all felt it. The spirit was so strong, so powerful. Never have I felt that in a meeting like that before. But it's because we were one, one in mind, one in heart. We loved the person. We knew this is what was the best for the person. We were all in tune. At other times, you know, you you do that, you have, and then as soon as men start talking about football and this and that and other stuff, their minds weren't actually in the game. Um, the state pregnancy might have had it, but this particular one, and it just really highlighted to me that if we want to redeem Zion, we all need to be on the same page. We all need to be firing our heart that we're going to redeem Zion. We're working towards our calling election, made sure we believe this is true. Joseph could come out any day. He could ask us. And this this is dependent upon us. It's we've got to do this. Um, it should be consuming everything we do. The whole purpose of our lives is to redeem Zion. Be like Kelly's little daughter. Is Jesus here yet? Is Joseph here yet? Is, it, is this where we're going? That is so cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Where's my backpack? But yeah, the uh, yeah. <laughs> and you know we have. We have that, you know, prophets flat out saying it. Like that that talk from President Benson as prophet of the church saying, saying, brothers and sisters, my beloved brothers and sisters, we must prepare to redeem Zion. And and members just go, eh. Yeah. Prophet after prophet. They keep saying it over and over and over again. Yeah. It's eh. Just... Yeah, I don't think he really means it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and not only that, that talk, but where I'm pride, man, he goes through the entire litany of of what caused it to fail in the first instance and what 
is going to make sure that it's not failed in the second instance. And President uh, uh, Nelson uh, recently said that the time is coming when those who obey the Lord will be separated from those who do not. And and President Benson let us know in that talk, beware of pride, what's going to put you on one side and what's going to put you on the other. So, yeah. Yep, very clearly. Just wonderful. So, yeah, yeah, Justin Howard said Joseph Boys is the answer. That's right. We uh, get that together. But Joseph Boys have got to be ready. They've got to do, they've got to have that. And that's, you know, I was speaking to someone a couple of months ago about calling election made sure, and they said, oh, yeah, yeah, 10 years ago I, I put a lot of effort into that, and then I realised I was asking for too much and I shouldn't. Shouldn't do it anymore. <laughs> Why? Why are you stopping? If the Lord's going to guide us to anything, he's going to guide us to having our calling elections made sure. Joseph Smith told us that, that we should be seeking after that. Everything we do, we should be working towards that. Yeah. And if we don't believe it's going to happen, it's not going to happen. It's as simple as that. You know, and, and there are, and, and I'm not perfect. There are moments that I get tired, I get exhausted. I don't want to do X, Y, or Z anymore. You know, I don't, I don't want to do this. And and I get the urge to fall back asleep. I get the urge to, ah, I was asking too much, and you know, it's just going to happen when it happens. Like I understand that. I understand that urge. But what I also know, not just understand what I know, is that the scriptures are true, and I know what the Savior said about those who look back once they've put their hands to the plow. And that is that mm. they're, they're not fit for the kingdom of God. And so I, I I want to stop. And there might be moments where I lay on my bed or do things and I feel sorry for myself. But the, the knowledge that I have, that foundation that I have, prevents me from staying there too long because I know what I want and I know I'm not going to get it if I stay there too long. And I know I definitely won't get it if I let go of the plow and start walking the other direction. Uh, you're gonna, you're, you're not fit for the kingdom, and and in, and in some cases, you might be turned into a pillar of salt. So, um, and that's the the important thing too. There, like you said, not no one on earth at this particular point in time is well. Maybe Joseph is on earth at this particular point in time. I think he is. But anyway, the mortals are not perfect. And they don't have to be perfect to receive your calling election made sure. You have to not have sins of rebellion. You have to be working towards. And, you know, you have those times where you flop down, and, oh, but you get back up again because of that knowledge, that assurance. And it's the grace. It's only through the grace of Christ that we can attain our calling election made sure after all we can do. And then, you, and that, and then that ties into... A, a, I, I know I'm laboring the point, but it's just been really pushed upon me. Believe that, hey, Joseph Cicluna, the you know the idiot that's done this or that, and the mistakes I've made, and and the things that I can't do, and you know I know all, I don't even know all the imperfections, but the imperfections I have, you mean I can get my calling lick and make sure? Oh, but if I say that, I'm proud. Nah, no, I'm not fighting against God about this. If I tell him I can't do it. Then I'm, pride, I'm prideful. He has told me that I can do it. And so, therefore, I need to accept and believe what he says. So this can happen. If I can do it, um, Micah can do it, Kat can do it, Reba can do it, um, Ammon can do it. We, we can do this as long as we just follow the steps laid out by God. You brought and it. We will redeem time. You brought a t you brought a tear to my eye there, Joseph, using the correct definition of pride. So that uh, <laughs> it's right. That's right. If you if you stay moping and you know uh, and just like that forever, and you don't reach for the hand of grace, that is pride. Not yeah. not saying I can do all things with the Lord. I mean that's that's an understanding and that's a a, a principle of that faith is a principle of power. And um, so, no, yeah, that's exactly right. We can do this. And and like you, you were just saying, what the realization I had a couple weeks ago that I shared with, uh, with with the fireside with the two brothers was that if it's not Micah, if it's not, you know, uh, Joseph, if it's not, uh, you know, Joel in the chat, if it's not Reba, it's going to be somebody. Like, that's what people have mm -hmm. to realize. It's going to be somebody. 
So if it's not if it's not you, it's going to be somebody else. Like the Lord, the kingdom rolls on with or without us. It's just, are you going to be a part of it? And so if it's gonna if it's gonna be somebody, why not make it you? You know, if if somebody's gonna get the pillar of fire and, and the cloud by day first, somebody's gonna 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 get it. So why don't you do it? You know, there had to be a group of people with Nephi that stood there and said, nope. I'm going to believe in the prophecies and that the, the, the sign will be given or you can kill me. Those people existed. They were real. Somebody had to be in that group. And they all might have been thinking at that time, uh, it's, you know, it's not going to be us, right? We've read about these stories like Nephi, and but it's not going to be us. And then all of a sudden, it was them. And and then all of a sudden, we're reading about them going, oh, it's not going to be us. And But then it became the next group and the next group. You know, there's always groups of people that, that stop saying it's going to be somebody else and start saying, we're going to do it, and then miracles start happening. Yeah, and that's, this is what the, the Lord's been telling us. This is the thief in the night bit. If, if uh, Joseph, it really is, however he does it, and I don't know how he's going to do it, but at some point in time, the scriptures are very clear that my messenger, Joseph Smith, is going to prepare the way for the second coming. And so he's going to contact People, however he does it, whether he uses Brigham Young or, or Heber or who, or he gives a phone or an email or whatever he does it, he's going to do it, general conference, whatever it is, but he is going to do it. And it's going to be like today, he hasn't done it. Tomorrow morning we're going to wake up and it's done. It's yeah. going to be there. And off we go. Yeah. Uh, just like Noah in the flood, just like the, it's, it's real. It's going to happen. Yeah. And so we've got to, yeah, I want to be part of that. And sorry, just one other thing. I was when I first got involved with this group and learnt uh, through Isaiah and Revelations and all the things that I've been studying through with, with what you've been putting out, Micah, and what others have been writing and so forth. I first of all went, okay, Heavenly Father, I'd be happy just just to be associated with these people. Um, that's I'll be happy to do that. And I prayed and I listened and I, and I prepared things and I, I'm listening to what He's saying, what the Lord's telling me to do. And you know what? I wouldn't be happy with that. I want to be there. My wife and I have talked about this and prayed about it many times. And so we went to the Lord and we said, Heavenly Father, we want to be there. We want to be, we want to receive Zion. We want we, we don't want it to come down later. We want to be there and assist Joseph Smith going to Zion. And the Spirit just bore witness to us both. Okay then. Get yourself ready. Yep. So that's what we're doing. I, I, I'm not going to doubt if the Lord reveals to me like he's revealed many other things to me in the past. He can do it now. And the scriptures say it can be done. It's not only the young men. There's the middle-aged men as well. So I can grasp into that. And so I'll be there. And uh, it's just so exciting. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. And we, and we yeah. all have to have that fire. We all got to ask. If we don't ask, then we won't know about the other stuff, eh? Yeah. And it, it, it all sounds crazy, right? It, it sounded crazy to the people in Noah's time, right? It, it just think about it, what it would have been like from their perspective. There, here's some crazy guy that literally can only get some of his family to listen to him. Like, not all of his family, just some of his family to listen to him. And he's off building a boat on dry land, and he's doing this for a hundred years. A hundred years he's preaching this. A hundred years. You don't think that at some point in time you're just like, this guy is crazy. And look, you know what the fruit of him being crazy is? Look how many less subscribers there are to Noah than us. Right? Yeah. Look at the numbers. There's so many more of us than him. And, and it becomes this, uh, you know, game of Alinsky where it's like the the bigger group trying to, you know, make the smaller group seem like th that they don't apparently have the answer. And then all of a sudden, one day you wake up and there's water there. It, it, it it's, it's, doesn't seem real, but somebody had to wake up in the flood and die. And, and yeah. somebody is going to wake up and, and not be invited for the redemption of Zion. Somebody's going to be that. And, and somebody is going to be the person in the ranks going to, to Jackson County. Like, it's going to be somebody. What we're here to decide, the, the, there's been a day of calling. This is a day of choosing. Like, this is, that is what that scripture means. 
There's been a day of calling. It's done happened. We're living in a day of choosing. So, you know, let those be chosen who are worthy. And so uh, that is that is where we are right now. And 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 I I could not agree more. And 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 by the way, Joseph, it's been one of the things that I've had to combat the most on YouTube. Probably <laughs> the most from from quote unquote saints is is I believe this stuff is going to literally happen. And 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 what's amazing is the 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 amount of saints that not only don't but actually are anti that. You know they they want to they want to spiritualize and make figurative everything and it's like not only you know will we not get these things with that kind of faith you won't be invited to it and that's what's that's what's more heartbreaking if you don't develop the faith as a brother Jared you're not going to be there yeah they're, they're obviously also missing the temple you know that the whole one of the main reasons for the temple is. We need to visualize ourselves going from the telestial to the terrestrial and into the celestial. Yeah. If you can't visualize yourself doing that, I think it's Alan who says that, if, can you imagine yourself in front of God? If we can't imagine ourselves actually going to Zion and redeeming Zion, and if we don't read the scriptures and believe what they say, we're not going to even know that that's what we should be thinking about. But once you start reading the scriptures, and, and listening to the prophets and see what they believe that what they say is true, that Jackson County, Missouri is Zion, that we that Joseph Smith is going to take his people there, that we will redeem Zion, like all the prophets have been asking us to do, then it's not going to happen for those people. But there will be people who do believe it, and that's going to happen. So that's, yeah, just the, yeah, I'm with you. It's amazing how people just don't want to see that. So and, I'm glad for the ones who do. I'm so I'm so thankful. This has been, and I know we all say this, but it's just so nice to finally meet people who understand. And 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 I'm not crazy. This is true. This is real. And and the spirit just keeps. Well, not just the spirit, but the scriptures over and over again. Now I'm seeing it. It just burst out to me that Zion is coming. We, we're going to get this, and it needs to happen because all these other things. And this is. It's a huge, this is a huge thing for the preparation for the second coming of the Saviour. It's what President Nelson's been preparing us for. It just blows me away. It's so wonderful to be a part of it. Yeah, that was, you know, that was Alma chapter 5. Super good questions. And, and, and the, what's crazy about this figurative versus spiritual thing is that the Lord even tells us that the redemption of Zion is going to take place and the Lord is going to, quote unquote, Make bear his holy arm in the eyes of all nations, end quote. Like, that's how he's described this event. And then he says yeah. in Doctrine and Covenants 101 that it's going to take place just like that. And he gives you the reason that these and all these things are going to take place exactly like that, quote, that the prophets might be fulfilled, that, that the prophets' words will be fulfilled. That's the reason. So the whole reason that 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 it, it's gonna you know it's going to take place literally and exactly like it said is because the, the Lord upholds His prophets. The Lord mm -hmm. is the Lord is not Satan. Like you would talk about Alma. Alma also had that experience with um, I believe it was Korhor, where you know he said that and we see that Satan does not uphold his his followers, but does speedily lead them to destruction. But the Lord isn't like that. The Lord isn't going to leave you know all of these prophets hanging and just be like, well, you know, I'll fulfill it in some other way. No, he's going to do it literally like this so that the that the prophets will be verified. Like that's the that's the, you know a, a a huge part of why we know it's going to be literal and we're going to have this uh, new Jerusalem. And uh and then the very next verse after he says that he says, "And there this is the place and there's no other place that I will ever appoint to replace this place. And yeah. so, I mean, it's, you're going to have That's to. A clarity. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, he's he's going to make that. He has made that super clear. So. And I wonder, do we, like um, for me anyway, what I found and I, I, I feel like I'm pretty average um, person. I don't think I'm anyway. So I've heard that for a while. And I've read that for a while and I've understood and I believed, but I now believe. 
Does that make sense? I believed it before, but now I really believe. And I, and I, I, I actually know that it's going to happen. And, and I think we, we, we need to get to that point of knowing it's going to happen and not be surprised if tomorrow the call comes. That we shouldn't be surprised. One of the things we get through a lot of movies and a lot of stuff in the past is, you know, these heroes, they, they just are surprised that uh, Skywalker shot and he got down the hole and, oh, yeah, that's good. Well, we won't be surprised when we get there. Those who actually are part of redeeming Zion or whatever the glorious thing will be won't be surprised because the Lord, they will have been asking, the Lord will prepare them, and it won't be a shock. It will be a shock for those who went, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll get there later. Uh, someone else will do it. And they'll be right because someone else will do it. That will be a shock when the Lord bears his arm. That's, that's a great statement. <laughs> All right, so we have a qu question here from Reba who says, do you think when people hear um, prepare to redeem Zion that they don't know how to go about doing that? Now, no, I, personally, I think that most members don't even know what he's saying. So I don't think that they understand what the word Zion means. I think that they think it means people's hearts. It means all sorts of kooky things. I don't think they even know what it is that he's saying. And they're too lazy to go figure it out. I, I don't think that most people here prepare to redeem Zion, uh, to redeem Zion, and they know that President Benson is talking about um, uh, redeeming Jackson County and building the New Jerusalem. I don't. I, I, re I don't believe that majority of members even know that that's what he said. To then question, well, how do I go about doing it? I would love it if the majority of members heard that and said, well, how do I go about doing that? I would love that. But I'll tell you this, Reba, from the last conference where I said that 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 I, I was frustrated sometimes with people's talks because a lot of times they would talk about a lot of stuff, but they wouldn't actually say, okay, how do you want us to go about doing these things? And people got upset at me for even asking to how to go about doing those. They'd like, oh, you, you're, you're a Pharisee, right? We're, we're not supposed to be told how to do things. We're supposed to figure it all out ourselves. And so I would, I would personally love it if people came away from that statement, brothers and sisters. We, it is our responsibility. We need to, we have to prepare to redeem Zion. And they went, "What does that mean? How do I do that? You know, what do I need to do to do that? You know, I would love that, but most members they sit there and it's, it's, it's a spiritual feel good thing where they just sit there and go, mm, "Yeah, that felt good." Mm, the light of Christ, I feel this warm tingly in, in, in my my belly, and then they don't do anything. Well, they just go to sleep the next six months. They don't they don't want to know what that is, and they they don't uh, they don't research it. And then when somebody like me comes out and they says, "Hey, do you want to know what this means?" they get upset. And so uh, I, I don't I don't see the majority of people just confused on that. I think that, and it's so clear that anybody you can you can ask the two brothers about this anybody who actually asked that question, who didn't know, what does that mean? It, it doesn't take long to figure it out. Like, you're going to, the Lord will lead you to somebody like me. The Lord will lead you to to the Doctrine and Covenants student manual. The Lord will quickly lead you to places where you'll go, oh, I get it. He'll, if you actually ask those questions and, and want to know, uh, I I have not found somebody who's like, I, I've asked this question faithfully for 30 years and I and I haven't gotten it. Like that, that is one of those questions that I've had people, and, and by the way, Joseph's one of them, who say, I prayed, Lord, and I said, I just said, uh, and, and, you know, and I don't want to throw her under the bus, but I know Antonio is another example. I, and I, there's a ton of examples I can give where they prayed and said, Lord, you know, lead me to where this, this further light knowledge is. And then boom, they stumbled across my channel the next day. And so, you know, it's, it's, if you, if, if members are really thirsting after that knowledge, and they're praying about it, I know that the Lord is going to give them that uh, fast because th that is super crucial to why we're in the church right now. And so if you want to, and I, you can also check out the references that uh, President Benson provided in that talk. Like, you know, so, um, yeah. So to answer your question, I don't see a lot of members just being confused at what that means and, and not knowing the answer to that. I see most members just apathetically just, you know, Feeling good about the talk and then never thinking about it again. And it's and it's different to going, 
Oh, I'd like to know. But as Micah said, uh, I actually got to the point. I've been I studied for a long time, and I wanted to know a lot for a while. But I got to the point where I said, Heavenly Father, I give up. I need to see a vision. You need to. I need. I, I want this. You know that that example of. Uh, do you want it as much as you a, a drowning man wants to get out of, out of the water? You gotta want it. And then when he wants, when I wanted it, uh, in my Google search, come the ten, uh, what was it the, the ten, uh, the, the last, uh, the last ten, the last ten tribes are coming. Thank you. That was the first one I hit. Bam! That was it. I was off. And then. I I, uh, I worked for myself, so I didn't do much work that week. But for for the next two weeks, I listened to every talk that Micah had, just absorbed, couldn't get enough of it. But and then, and I don't I, I use the word stumble there. Heavenly Father put that in my screen for me because I asked. So I totally agree with you, Micah. There's no doubt that the Lord will lead us to when we ask the question. Uh, and that ties back into what you were saying earlier on about the apostles. Why didn't they get to know about Americas, because they didn't ask. Yeah. We've got to ask. And the Lord will tell us what to ask when we ask. Yes. If we keep asking, he'll tell us, okay, you need to ask this and this. But if you're not asking, then it, it goes darker and darker. The more you go into the light, the more light you will get. And there are the and, attitude of asking. So and there are some things like, you know, and I Ashley and I have experienced this. Lord, please bless us with a child. And there are some things that that what you're asking the Lord, the Lord can't give you at that time. There are, mm -hmm. Lord, please, you know, remove me from Liberty Jail, you know, right now. And you're, you're maybe not going to get that answer, right? But there are certain things, like Joseph Smith uh, said in the quote that Joseph read tonight, that more than anything, you, you are obligated, you know, from a loving Heavenly Father to have these questions answered, right? Like, why are you here? Why are you born to just die and go away? What is your purpose in life? Like, these are questions that you don't have to wait long to get the answers to. Because there's no reason for the Lord not to give you that if you have desire, if you have real intent, if you have sincerity, if you have faith in Christ. If you, There's no reason that he won't give you that information. And, and Joseph said, just five minutes ago, he said, I knew, but I didn't know. And here, and that was the other quote that Joseph shared today. If you could gaze into heaven five minutes, you would know more than if from everything written in the books. And see, here's the thing is that a lot of people think, oh, that must be a vision. You don't have to gaze into heaven merely with mortal eyes. There are, there are ways to gaze into heaven that hit your heart. And that's absolutely right. There, there are things that where you can read a scripture, read every word that, you know, is written about the redemption of Zion. And then all of a sudden, boom, you have gazed into heaven five minutes in your heart and your mind and soul have caught something that all the books written on the subject couldn't contain. Mm. Yeah, I got that tonight as I was reading that. I didn't understand that before. That is so cool. And and also, too, with the questions you asked, you just said sometimes the Lord won't give it, and I... I often now ask, if I have a thought that I want to ask a question, I will ask, is it okay to ask this question? Especially yes. if I don't get an answer straight away. And then he'll let you know whether you should be asking it right then and there or not. And maybe it's something you need to leave for a while or maybe whatever. Because he he gives us the experiences we need to have. Yes. Um, and multiple. And once again, there's another concert of clarity. You can find what Joseph just said in examples of a, a plethora of prophets that have gone to the Lord and said, Lord, please don't get angry at me. You have commanded me to ask you. And so, mm -hmm. so I'm going to ask you, right? And I'm going to ask you this question, is this all right? And the Lord will go, yay, nay. And uh, so, yeah, you can, don't be afraid to go to the Lord and say, can I ask you this? He's not going to get mad at you. But, uh, you know, you need to be willing to listen to the answer. But, uh, but Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. And you have you have that example over and over again uh, from prophets. Just don't go back three times. Yeah, like with Martin. <laughs> yeah. So can I can I please ask you something? Yes. Can I do this? No. Okay, I'll be back in a week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't don't be that kid. So, um, Aaron Allen says most memberships think the second coming 
is all a surprise. Could be tomorrow or 100 more years, and then the church builds Zion. Until then, do nothing and tolerate everyone. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it's, once again, it's like I said earlier, and I'll say again and again, I don't know where they're getting that. And I'm not saying that facetiously. People always say, Micah, you're condescending, you're facetious. I'm not being facetious. I'm literally, I don't know what in the standard works you're reading to come to that conclusion. Like, I don't know what you're reading. It, 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 you're, we're, we're, we're reaching a point in time where it's like the wheat and the tares are becoming so divided that it's like, I don't understand you. Like, I don't, can, can you point to something in here? And it's like, oh, I don't even use the standard works, right? The standard works are pish posh. You know, I use my spirit meter entirely. And it's like, we can't communicate then, you know, because uh, the iron rod is the word of God. Like that was the primary song I grew up on, right? <coughs> so, uh, but apparently none of that matters anymore. You know, it's like we make fun of these primary songs that the iron rod is the word of God. Eh, not important. Follow the prophet. Follow the, ah, not important. It's like, oh my yes. goodness. It's a word. Yeah, I had a, uh, in my Sunday school class, I was really encouraging people to study, pray, and ask the Lord to reveal something new as you read the scriptures. Um, and, I, and I was laboring the point week after week, and uh, someone then said to me, you know, I grew up in the church, and yeah, I served the mission, and I was full time, and I did that, and I was good. So, but what I found I get the most joy is service. So I really concentrate on service and teaching my family to give service. And I, I, I sort of, we, we, went, we went on from there, but I pondered and talked about it with my wife afterwards. And that's so sad because how can you take away the word of God? As I, as I mentioned, you can serve and give away all that you have, but if you're not connected to the word of God and listen, that's, holding on to the iron rod you know some of those people that let go of the whole of holding on to the iron rod they went to be with their other friends and do other stuff and, and were kind and nice people they were great people but you can't let go of the iron rod otherwise the mist of darkness will come and you'll fall asleep or you'll find yourself in the great and spacious building yeah no. yeah even worse yeah yeah that's exactly right so, um, okay, fire nice. Oops, I forgot. Oh, must be above. It was this it. If every barren woman gets kids after praying, why is the condition if not to try the soul? Um, so the question is, um, why do some barren women get kids and some don't if not to try the soul? And that's the, I would say that, that is the reason to try the soul. And, um, you know, um, I think you answered it. I think it's spot on. It's to try the soul. And so. Yeah. Well, brothers and sisters, are there any more questions? This has been absolutely awesome. I, I, man, I cannot stress enough how much I have been ready for a very long time uh, for a group like this that, that wants the redemption of Zion and the building of New Jerusalem. And, um, I, I, I here, here's when I say stuff that gets me in trouble. So here's why I say stuff that gets me in trouble. I, I would, I would always ask the missionaries when they served in the area and, uh, I would ask them, okay, if Jesus Christ came to you while we were in this branch or this ward and he said, okay, elder Jones, you have to name five people in this branch that you are ward, that you know are going to be in the celestial kingdom exalted. But if you get one of them wrong, you will lose your exaltation. Would you be able to easily come up with five answers that you'd feel comfortable with? And, you know, and I, I, I'm going to get in trouble for, for this, but I love those, I love those rhetorical questions. Huh? I said, go for it. I love it when you do this. Go on. Uh, so, yeah. So, I love, I love these rhetorical questions. That makes people really actually think. You know, would you be willing to bet your exaltation on five members in your, in your local ward or, or branch that you would be willing to bet your exaltation on? My and, answer is no. Yeah. My, my answer is no. And, um, and, I, and I would do this with missionaries everywhere. I did it, you know, on my mission. I would do it in Philadelphia. I, you know, I, do it in, I did it in Winnipeg. I do it in Thunder Bay. I did it in Kenora. I did it everywhere. And, and, and the purpose of that was we could all do better. 
We could, that was the whole purpose of it. We can do better. And, um, and where am I getting at with this? I could pick five people from this group that I would feel comfortable with. And that is a, a, a miracle that I, I've got to witness that I frankly did not know that I would get to witness and frankly is something I didn't know that I needed as much as I needed. I, I, you know, there's, when you go with things alone for so long, like I have in my life, and, and being this guy, you know, the guy that everyone hates because, you know, he reads the scriptures too much and takes things too literal. Um, you just learn to, to go at things alone and you just think, okay, I just got to be the lone grape on the vine, you know, uh, and that's just my calling. That finally, when you get surrounded by people who are similar, who have the same passion and the same faith in Christ, and the same willingness to throw all their sins on the altar and say, I'm done with this. All of a sudden, I realized how much I missed. I, I missed that in my life and how, how grateful I am to, 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 to know the people that I've come to know in this group. And not because these people are perfect, not because any of you are perfect, but because I know you're on the right path. And there is enough of you in here that I could pick five. And, and that and that I could say, I'd be willing to bet my exaltation that they're not going to be perfect, but they're going to do everything they can to get there. That that they are, they're not, Zion or bust is not just a fun catchphrase that they're not going to go back to sleep. That they are, they are doing things that they've never done before. Some of these members have never done missionary work. They've never opened their mouth and now they're doing it. And they're finally doing it. And it's it's like, do you realize how much of a miracle that really is? I've, I've served missions. I've been with missionaries all over the place. Do you not realize how hard it is to get members to do missionary work? It is so hard. And, and members are doing it in this group. They're saying, wow, you know what? This is right. I need to open my mouth. And they're doing it. That We are witnessing miracles in this group that that I, I, I don't know how many people in the group realize what what they're watching and how much of an anomaly it is. This is not the normality. This is not the normality. The normality is that most members would would have panic attacks and, and probably die of exertion trying to come up with five people in, in their own ward or branch that they would be willing to bet their exaltation on. That that's the normality. Okay, you know that is not the what we're experiencing now with with. Uh, you know, YouTube and social media that allows us to connect. I mean, for crying out loud, Perth, Australia, apparently has become a hotbed for, you know, people, people. And that's, I'm not, you know, you're laughing. That's not a joke. I don't understand. Like, there's like four or five families down there that are like bleeding New Jerusalem and Zion. And it's like, this would never have happened before. Social yeah. social media has has created a platform that has enabled this to happen, just like it was said would happen in 3524, that those that feared the Lord began. They just started to meet together and talk off. Now think about that. That means that they weren't meeting before. And 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 if it was talking about just the church, will we meet with them every week? So so why is it that at this time that these people just started to meet? Some other medium, some other ability or way for these people to meet must have been provided. And and so, you know, and then something brought them together like COVID. And so I, I can I cannot express my gratitude for for that blessing that I didn't even know I wanted. I and that's the what we would call a tender mercy of the Lord. Something that was just that it's just so nice. But you didn't even know that you wanted it. It's just like when, when your spouse walks in with something that you, you know, like a hot, hot cup of cocoa, you know, or if you're a man, a sandwich and a brew. And by brew, I mean diet soda. But and it's just like, wow, I didn't even know how much I wanted that sandwich. And uh, mm -hmm. thank you for that, that tender mercy. And how much meeting this group, it was just a tender mercy for me. I didn't even know how much this could bless my life and change you know, uh, my outlook and give me so much more hope. And, um, and it makes everything 10 times better 
Because these other these things I've believed forever. But now I have it's not just, oh, I'll get to I'll get to meet people someday who are like me. It's like, no, now I'll get to meet, you know, Aaron. I will get to meet Joseph. Like it's more than just, you know, it's more than just uh, you know, faceless people. The, the, I know there's people and families and their children that I know. And um, and that's just a blessing that I, I will be forever grateful for. So thank you all for um, blessing my life like that. And I'm sure many of us here would be saying exactly the same back at you. It's, it's been fantastic. It's just wonderful. Um, and that's what Heavenly Father's doing, isn't it? Building Zion. We're going to get this because we're going to be on one heart, one mind. Oh, it's so lovely. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, is there any more questions or are we going to wrap this up? I'll, I'll wait for like 10 seconds here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think we're getting to nearly four hours. So. Yeah, the tick down is here. Good on uh, you, Karen. Yeah, amen. And, and that's what I'm saying, that there are people like Jocelyn who says I was never a missionary, Karen who said that, you know, she never had the confidence to do missionary work that are now opening their mouth. And, and I, you know, I don't want you to not understand, Karen, how much of a miracle that is. You, to you, they might be like, oh, now I have the courage and I'm doing some missionary work. But that is a miracle. It is not normal. You know, the, the, the chances of, 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 and I do missionary work everywhere, that you would have a better chance of, of finding Joseph Smith somewhere on this earth than fi finding finding a member who's been a member for more than, let's say, five years and, and hasn't done any missionary work and then, you know, turning them around. It just, it doesn't happen. You know, the, yeah. the longer a member is a member, the more they just become cliquish and just kind of fall into the ranks of the church and then they, they don't ever reach out again. And so, you know, that is a miracle. And, and people are actually changing. And so I, I love that. Well, brothers and sisters, I love you. You 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 give you give uh, hope and and strengthen me in my faith and 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 buoy me up. And I'm so grateful for that. Just want to thank Joseph and uh, Ryan and Kelly again for um, the the additions to the fireside. These will not would not be the same without you. And so uh, the guests as well as the people in the chat uh, adding contributions and their thoughts and their questions. Brothers and sisters, I love you. God bless. Godspeed. Keep the faith. And uh, we'll talk again really soon. Joseph, did you have anything else you wanted to add before we close? Uh, thank you. You said it well. Talk to you next time. <laughs> All right, guys. We love you. God bless. We'll talk soon. Zion or bust. Zion or bust.